Um, my main channel, I've been temporarily suspended because yesterday uh, or the day before, uh, Josh Bernstein and I talked about the Maricopa County recount. Apparently, that's a no-no in YouTube, even though it's in all the papers in Arizona. And it's uh, it was approved by the Arizona State Senate, which, of course, is the legal authority in that state and uh, that they appropriated $150 million toward uh, conducting the recount, but apparently it's too much for YouTube. So that you can't talk about that. And I'm not talking about it right now, other than just to note that that's the subject. We're not gonna go into that. Stan Catabone is here. Stan, um, you have a long standing case as a whistleblower going way back. Um, you have uh, been, you were on the inside of, of the US government um, and you uncovered some major corruption that's still there. Talk about your case and what's going on now. Well, they're they're coming after me pretty hard, just like uh, Julian Assange and the Russian uh, prisoner. Um, they're gassing me inside my house. And gassing you? You mean like putting in, you know, literal gas? Oh yeah, toxic fumes. I have three exhaust fans I have to run. And uh, it, it chokes you, it makes you cough, it makes you hack. Um, they shut me down. They shut down my YouTube. I can't get YouTube TV anymore because they say it's a gift card. I'm getting Welcome to hack everything. Yeah. They, uh, like I say, the poisoning, they poisoned the Russian Valvani. You're familiar with this case, the Russian yeah, prisoner. Yeah, of course. That, Navalny, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Well, did you see, he did uh, an interview. His daughter did an interview. Yeah. And he's got leg and back pain, just like me. What an and incredible poison. Just briefly, I mean, he was he was poisoned while he was in, uh, in Germany. Um, he was in the hospital, he recovered. Uh, it, it created an international uh, break of relations with, with Russia. He actually went back to Russia where he was immediately placed under arrest. Now he's in prison and they think that he might be dying in prison. Yeah, he went on a three week hunger, hunger strike. Right, incredible. And Nils, Nils Meltzer, the uh, Rapporteur for Torture for the United Nations, yeah. is really trying to bring everything to light. What's going on is these principal countries are talking about how torture is illegal and this and that. But they're all doing it. And they don't want to seem to change. So I don't know if you're familiar with Nils Meltzer, but he's the rapporteur for torture for the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. And what he does is he took on Julian Assange's case and he gave the United States 60 days to reply to a letter whether they would uh, apply his mandate, which is no torture, especially psychological now. He's considering psychological torture equivalent to physical torture. So internationally, there's a lot going on, but domestically, the news doesn't really cover too much. Well, yeah, I mean, the, we, we can talk about, and I kind of alluded at the beginning of this program to the control of the news and the means of communication. Um, it's quite arbitrary now. It has nothing to do with community standards, I would suggest. It has everything to do with politics. And um, as I found out, and as many people I know have found out. Um, so here you are trying to uh, to blow the whistle. You have recently a case. What's going on? Well, I've got several cases in court. I've got two cases, three cases in the U.S. District Court for Eastern Pennsylvania down in Philadelphia. I've got a case in the Third Circuit in Philadelphia, and I'm still pending amicus to Nicholas Cruz for his case, trying to prove out that he's a victim of mind control, which he is. There's no doubt that he is. And if you listen to his interview right after he performed the killing, I mean, he's so matter of fact, and he talks about the voices to the interviewer. It's an enlightening interview. They released it a couple months ago. I have it up on my uh, on my Twitter page. I okay, you know, Stan, I want to I want to go in a little deeper on the question of of government sponsored mind control, which um, 
I mean, it's obviously a uh, an issue that the elites have always studied, going all the way back to the ancient times of idol worshiping. But on to, in today's standards, it really ratcheted up around World War II, when you had intelligence agencies both in the United States and in Great Britain and Russia. In Britain, I think it was the Tavistock Institute do mind control experiments on massive numbers of people and manip mind manipulation. And we're not just talking about uh, Edward Ber uh, Bernays, the uh, nephew of Sigmund Freud, the author of Propaganda, who talked about, he actually coined the word public relations, the father of marketing, who talked about how to manipulate people to buy cigarettes and um, egg, you know, ham and eggs. We're talking about something much more direct in terms of manipulating individuals to do certain things. Now, this was claimed by assassins in modern times. This was what uh, Lee Harvey Oswald meant when he said that he was a patsy just before he was taken out. This has been claimed many times in interviews with Sirhan Sirhan, who was the assassin of Robert F. Kennedy, and something that, by the way, has been echoed by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., in that he goes through a scenario where he feels that he had been, he was a mind controlled robot. He didn't even know what he was doing at the time yeah, of the assassination. I, I filed an amicus for him. He's in a human rights court down in uh, DC. And I filed an amicus for him after Robert Kennedy Jr., the, the attorney, uh, came out and said half the Kennedy family doesn't believe Sirhan is the actual killer. So I have an amicus on that case. Now it's not a court case, it's human rights uh, counsel. So it's not like the other court cases. But now the problem is, is that these technologies are mainstream. You look at Elon Musk, his company called Neuralink, they developed the chip just, just like the CIA used to use for mind control. Mm -hmm. Now there, he's testing, he's, he's got a monkey playing ping pong through voice control. You know, he, 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 and this is by years. implementing a chip. I mean, we know that uh, Soviet uh, psychiatrist Pavlov experimented with that, the famous Pavlov's dogs. Um, but uh, you're saying that it's now taken another step in terms of literally controlling someone through computer technology. Yeah, it's called brain to computer in interface, BCI. Okay. The problem is it's, it's commercialized. Microsoft is, is dabbling in it. Um, Facebook is dabbling. They're all trying to, it, it's like an arms race now for these mind control technologies. And what happened is it's a very strategic plan in that the government, it went from basically mind control went from CIA, then it went to FBI, DOD, uh, NSA. And now they're kind of, turning a blind eye as these other companies develop commercial applications. Now, a lot of these applications are for people with disabilities, they help people that are paralyzed, use their mind to control computers, their wheelchair and things like that. That's how they're, they're presenting it. But there's, you know, malicious agendas out there and you don't know who's doing what with what technology. I mean, the technologies are, are alarming. What, I mean, they can control every aspect of your body. Well, you know, this is something that's really out in the open now. I know that a year ago, uh, Alex Jones talked about this. He's been banned by sure. the way. Oh yeah, and, he had uh, a lot and, of guests on. Oh yeah, and people said, oh, you're, you know, you're a tin hat conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago that 60 Minutes did a segment where they talked about how DARPA, which is a program that was started DARPA. by Eisenhower, um, and uh, that's part of the Pentagon, they showed how they are experimenting with a chip. They had the scientists talk about this on 60 Minutes. This guy Halperin, who looked like a cult follower with his eyes all buggy, you know, one of these people are like, you know, a real freak in my, he looked to me. And he was holding it up and showing the camera and how wonderful this is. And what this thing is gonna do, according to him, is it's going to once implanted into the human body it's going to monitor the body to see whether or not it's been exposed to a virus. Like we need that as if we don't know that we are exposed to a virus, you know, but um, yeah. you know, to me, that was, was at, at least 
a mainstreaming of and a legitimizing of everything that Alex Jones has been talking about. Yeah, it's funny. DARPA is one of the companies I did work for back in 1991. I helped yeah. develop speech recognition and DARPA sponsored it through NIST. And what they do is that 60 minutes piece is propaganda. What they do is they'll say they have this technology, but really it's 10 years ahead of what they're showing you. It's propaganda. Oh yeah, no, and, and it was all, it was basically presented quite slickly as yeah. some great and glorious piece of progress. So we should be, you know, essentially, you know, bowing down to this, like it's some kind of a graven image, like this is the great future. Well, they have nano chips now and everything else. And I think that's where a lot of the conspiracy theories yeah. came out about the vaccine, whether they were putting nano particles in and chips in. You know, I have somebody texting me on TikTok right now saying that David Icke has been talking about the nano chip. I think he's been completely banned from, from media. Oh, yeah. I'm not talking about with him. years. He, he's, uh, I mean, his some of his stuff is not the kind of thing I, I do agree with at all. <laughs> I mean, right. in terms of like, you know, the lizard you know, shape shifting and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Lizard, but, yeah. you know, it gets, gets a little wo woolly and wild for my taste. But, you know, look. That's freedom of speech. He's not harming anyone by talking about that. And he does bring up also some very important technical questions. Well, yeah, you know the uh, Nashville bomber who bombed Nashville? You know, in, you know, on Christmas morning? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now, he was into this 5G, and he, was, he probably could have been a victim where he was saying they were using 5G to release to, to more or less uh, for microwaves. Okay. But he also talked about reptilian. A lot of these targets are in the, in the extreme conspiracy theories, along with being targets. And it's kind of like a false flag. You never think they're targets because they talk about the extreme conspiracy theory stuff when actually they are targets. You well, know what I mean? You have to be careful with, with, and you have to be careful with conspiracy theories because we don't know who's behind them. Uh, and they can be uh, as crazy as the people who condemn them. But we just don't know because by nature, a conspiracy is something done in secret. And therefore, it is secret. We don't know. And, uh, you know, we can say with, with, with obvious certainty that conspiracies are happening because, I mean, if they're happening in, in crime, then they're happening in politics and they're happening in, in culture. You know, it's just people do stuff in secret because they don't, they know if it's, if it's exposed, it'll be rejected. So they function in secret and they have agendas that are trying to uh, do stuff that uh, is not in the best interest of people. So, of course, there are conspiracies all the time. But we have to be careful when we talk about them specifically because they are conspiracies and we don't know and we may be wrong and people can go up a really, that's why I've never been one to embrace the QAnon because we don't know who's behind that. You know, that could be a false flag. I mean, who knows? You know, we can look at some elements of it and say, hmm, that sounds like it's uh, out there. Uh, but but you have to approach it with very great care anyway. Well, you know, as far as my case goes, you know, I'm relegated to a wheelchair. I'm having trouble walking to the bus stop. Mm -hmm. Now, I never had anything physically wrong with me as far as my legs. It's from the microwave weapon. You know, so I've been you, telepathic 16 years. Could you years talk straight. a little bit exactly about what it is that you blew the whistle on that caused you to have this kind of pro these sort of a problematic, um, you know, bringing yeah. it to the attention of the government? In 1982, uh, a stockbroker called me up to invest in a local defense contractor called International Signal and Control. And the stockbroker went on to be a high-ranking Republican in the Pennsylvania House. Anyway, I bought a 1,000 shares of the stock. And in 1987, I built a financial firm, a fairly large firm. We were in five states in a matter of nine months with a 20,000-square-foot office here in Lancaster. And it was a one-stop financial firm. We had accountants, attorneys, real estate, brokers, uh, underwriters, life insurance, and things like that. So this company came to me and wanted to, me to finance some operations of theirs. Mm -hmm. And 
They had an, what's called an 8A set-aside company, which is a mar- minority company linked up to the company, and they were having problems with the contract. They wanted me to refinance uh, a plant and uh, try to save the contract. But what happened was the executive that came to see me didn't tell me that he was from the parent company, International Signal Control. So I raised uh, some issues regarding fraud with some contracts. Well, they arrested me, uh, targeted me, performed a Cointel Pro op on me, threw me in prison. They threw five missed them, five felonies at me and four misdemeanors. Then, while this was going on in the summer of '87, this company was merging with a large defense contractor in Great Britain called Ferrani. So they merged in December, and in March, they dismissed all my charges. They were all fabricated. So they fabricated the charges on me and gave me a fabricated mental health wrap. Mm-hmm. Then four years later, they were indicted as one of the largest frauds in U.S. history. Essentially, this company called ISC, was the, uh, they have the patents for the custom bomb. And they were uh, arming Saddam Hussein with all types of weapons. Cluster bombs, telepathy systems, and their first contract was with the NSA. So they were indicted. Then they really came after me. They tried to kill me, a couple, you know, a couple of different ways, usually with cars and things like that. So back then I was trying to get attorneys. No one would take my case. Of course, you know, they're they're at the attorney's doors before I am every time. So then in 2005. I just thought I was going to go pro se, represent myself and file my own lawsuit, mm-hmm. which I did. And once I did that, then they hit me with the electromagnetic weapon in the microwave. Yeah. No, I mean, it's hor- It's a horrifying, frightening story. You know? Yeah. It's, I'm totally isolated. I mean, I don't, they, yeah. I, they don't really let me talk to anyone. They don't let, you know, anyone around me. Everyone, all everyone does around me is stalk and harass me. My house is broken into every day. I mean, it's broken into while I'm here. I'll be upstairs on the third floor in the basement. Something will be missing or mm-hmm. broken. Or I mean, they're really obnoxious and arrogant how they do perform these operations. How are you uh, protecting yourself and how are you uh, moving forward with, with all this going on? Well, you know, over the years, I've learned to counter things. The other problem is that my, my father was Navy. He was a victim before I was. He was part, he was getting electroshock, and he had synthetic stuff that they performed on him. And my brother was part of the LSD experiment in the Air Force. Uh, that was like so by the t- Olson, right? Pardon me. That's like what happened to Olson. Olson, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when they started at me, I had a little bit of experience being around this stuff when I was younger, mm-hmm. because I had to help my mom through. They killed my brother in Santa Barbara, California, Christmas Day of '84. Okay. My father, they hit uh, in 2001, and my youngest brother died in Kilbert Devil Hills, North Carolina, in 1996, suspicious suicide. So I've learned to counter things. Uh, one thing I do is I learned uh, how to sleep. They sleep deprive you. So I'll work for five or six hours, seven hours, sleep for two or three, and, and that's a continuous cycle. So that's one way I've been able to maintain some energy and keep productive and i eat well i cook all my own food i cook as much as possible eat fruits vegetables things like that i have exhaust fans to counter the toxic fumes mm-hmm. they also poison my medical marijuana it gags me so i found a method out i smoke under the exhaust fan and that helps alleviate that as far as the pain goes i take a couple whirlpools a day in, a, in my bathtub, they have what's called a Conair mattress. If the mattress fit a regular tub, it turns it into a whirlpool. I do that. I vibrate my body. I have a massaging mat, full-length mat for my body that I lay on in bed, and I have hand massage. And that helps alleviate the pain. And, of course, you know, medical marijuana and things like that. Okay. Well, I'm hack, computer hacking, I can't. I got to wipe my computer every couple of days. Yeah, no, I, I mean that's something that's that's probably um, 
once you're online, I mean, we know what happened with certain machines uh, and we're not gonna talk about this here, but it was um, related to the events of the first Tuesday of November of last year. There were certain machines that were online. Let's just leave it at that. Um, you know, I also can relate to your story, Stan, only in that um, I had, I'm not gonna get into the details here, but a microcosm of similar situations in 2006, when I, in 2004, when I was running for Congress in Massachusetts against Congressman Barney Frank. So there were, there were things that were going on that I'm never gonna talk about. Um, but the government can do yeah. a lot of things to a, a person. And, um, you know, it's uh, power is power, you know, and um, as Lord Acton said, power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Corrupt, the United absolutely. States is by no means immune to these kinds of powers that um, we conventionally thought we got rid of when we kicked out the British monarch yeah, <laughs> in, right. in 1776. You know, it's still there. I believe in our system. I believe we still have a constitution and we still have a, a balance of powers and that uh, people need to wake up and, and use that system, run for local office, speak out. You know, I mean, the only way to counter this encroaching techno fascism is to uh, challenge it in on the street, challenge it any way you can, you know, do, do it yeah. peacefully, do it legally. I'm not, I'm not, I'm nonviolent. I'm a pacifist, but do so uh, using the tools and the levers that we have access to, you know? Yeah. My problem is that the Lancaster city police were involved with my father. They did the same thing to him that they're doing to me. And they're so wired in with the judges. And everyone else that mm. you know it's like you know me versus everyone yeah and the problem yeah. is that they turn the other way for the computer hack you know i'm trying to file a, a court document today i'll go into my computer and it will be a different document and i have to spend my time trying to resurrect it find where you know where they didn't uh meddle with it i mean it it, it gets tiring it's very I have $72,000 worth of vandalism and theft. Yeah. Money that I had to pay for in two years. And I, you know, I, I, I've been able to collect disability for being a victim of US sponsored mind control. I was awarded that back in 2009. I used my father's case, my case, and my brother's case. And it only took me four months to get the benefit. And that's a very unusual. You know, I didn't even need an attorney, I did right. it myself. Well, I mean, I guess that, uh, you know, one one thing that people do that is uh, this kind of a trend toward localism. People are, um, you know, growing their own fruits and vegetables and they're doing yeah. they're purchasing locally. In fact, um, even in um, in Berkshire County in Massachusetts, where I live, I live in Boston, but Berkshire County is in the western part of the state. You have people issuing their own currency, right? They call it the Berkshire. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, Going it's, off the radar. It, that's right. Stores accept that currency, then it's money. It's, yeah. it's money is basically uh, only has the value of that which people endow it with. And uh, I mean, our national currency has value because of the full faith and credit of the government, not because of anything tangible. And so you can do that locally. Not that I'm suggesting you do, but I'm only bringing it up as an example of how people are beginning to assert their sovereignty both as individuals and through local governments and local structures. Um, and I think that's that's really the future right now. Yeah, I think the biggest problem is all these recent mass shootings. What's, uh, yeah, very, we're, we're talking about alarming. mind control. What, what do you account for that, Stan? You know, here we have a, a, a situation where one of the last bastions of freedom, I would suggest, is the fact that there are 350 million legal registered firearms in this country and they are owned by responsible, honest American citizens. Um, so whenever there is one of these instances, which are very bizarre, somebody going in and starting to open fire at a supermarket, there are national calls to confiscate people's private firearms. They may call it, not call it that, because they can't, 
given the numbers that are out there. But that's ultimately what this is. So you talk, we're talking about mind control here. We're talking about MK Ultra and the government uh, involvement in that, which is, by the way, not a conspiracy theory. That is part of the testimony of the church committee of the 19, late 1970s, where that was exposed. What Do you think there is a connection between mind control tactics and these recent mass murders? Oh, yeah, definitely. Not all of them. But right. for some of them, you can see it right away. Usually what happens is they're passed through the system. In other words, they're interviewed by the FBI or local police, and nothing happens to them, and then they end up killing. The other thing is that when they're interviewed, they're matter of fact. Like, it was a video game, and nobody really got killed. You can see, I, I try to follow common traits in a couple of these cases, but there, there's been so many the past couple of weeks. Mm. You know, it, it makes you dizzy. And some of them are probably Manchurian. I mean, that's the word they use when they develop the uh, technology to control somebody's mind and use them for assassins. Um, right. But, you know, it, it's, uh, it's alarming. Well, it's, very alarming. Extremely, it's extremely abnormal and, um, and deviant in terms of, if you look at the statistics, like, for example, right up until maybe around the time of the Columbine killings, this was extremely, right. extremely rare. There was only, rare. One, there was oh, only yeah. one case that we really know of very publicly in the 1960s, and that was the guy who went to the top of the tower at the University of Texas in Austin and started to shoot people, take pot shots at people walking below the tower. And it was a big, big national story. It was very shocking. I don't know if there's ever been an explanation for that, but this was not the kind of thing that happened. I mean, it happened once every, you know, decade, you know, at best, where you'd have yeah. this kind of a thing. Now it's it's a regular thing. So what, you know, we have to look at this scientifically. Well, well you what, know, uh, yesterday or the day before was the anniversary for the Oklahoma bombing. Yes. Timothy McVeigh. I yes. listen to this. Back. In 05 and 06, when I first, uh, when they first took me up to the telepathy, synthetic telepathy, they they used to conference call me with other people, with two other people. In other words, they'd hook me up to somebody else. They hooked me up to Timothy McVeigh. Now, we were talking telepathically, just like a, a cell phone, clear as could be. And he was telling me some of the problems he was having with the guards and in the prison. And it sounded legit. Now, I could never verify that it was him or not. But this is the, some of the stuff they do with this technology. It's weird. They do weird things with it. Back in 05 and 06, they, had, they asked me a question. They said, listen, and these, these guys that were talking to me telepathically identified themselves as CIA. They said, listen, if if you had the opportunity and there was a cave, would you go in and talk to Osama bin Laden? And they did this to me a couple of times. And it took me a couple of years, but I figured out what they were doing. They were trying to get me to remote view his location because they didn't know where he was back then. And they used remote viewers. I don't know if you're familiar with You say remote, remote viewers. viewers. The only thing that I've heard about that is through interviewing someone who was a um, kind of a whistleblower on Scientology, who said that this is part of what they're up to with the remote viewing. And, you know, they, they claim they can see stuff from space. I, mean, I don't, to me, it sounds like science fiction, but. Um, well, they, you know, the, the, the government invested a lot of money in remote viewing projects. In fact, I have interviews with a guy named Dale Graff, and he developed, the Army's remote viewing program, uh, Operation Starburst or something like that. Anyway, Dale Graff, D-R-A-F-F. -F. And he's from central Pennsylvania. He's from, you know, around here. And he talks about how he developed the remote viewing program for the Army. Mm -hmm. And essentially what remote viewing is, is it's the ability through clairvoyance or what have you to see uh, someone else in another location. In other words, it's not, it's not the future, mm -hmm. it's just 
a distance type thing. It, you know, are, they using like technology, are they using technologies like, um, you know, like ways, you know, like when you drive, you can see, you know, like location and, um, you know, when, it, by the way, even if you have Facebook or any of the social medias, you, you actually might inadvertently click something or give permission for them to view you. And, uh, right. And in fact, I, I think that I saw something about um, how to undo that. I can't explain it right now. There are ways to, to protect your social network so that they can't view you, they can't hear you, but you have to go through different prompts to do it. But um, yeah, is, is this what we're talking that. about, this this kind of technology? That, well, uh, that... see, if you, if you study it, the Russians actually developed remote viewing. Well, they, they, they were developing developing ESP way back, yeah, sure, developing sure. ESP way back in the 70s. Right, right, yep. And I think we picked up because they were more or less ahead of us with some of these technologies. But remote viewing came out of ESP. People have the natural ability, I believe, to remote view. And that's what they were delving into. That's what they were trying to develop. They were trying to more or less reverse engineer the human natural ability to remote view. Now, I, you know, I, okay. I have enough on my plate. I don't know where they're at with the program now. I don't get that involved with remote viewing, but mm -hmm. anyway, it's real stuff. I mean, they spent a lot of money sure. on remote viewing, the, the intelligence community, and the military. Well, I mean, they've spent, you know, you, you know, there are so many moving parts to the story of, of um, government intelligence involved in mind control manipulation all the way from the use of psychedelic drugs on the street, uh, Timothy Leary and um, people like uh, psychologist, psychiatrist Julian West in uh, Los Angeles, UCLA, we're, we're, we're dealing uh, with uh, LSD on the street to try to experiment with people and just uh, introduce it to society, see what would happen. So, I mean, that's not new. I mean- Did you all, ever see uh, the movie Jacob's Ladder? No. Jacob's Ladder was a strain of LSD that the CIA developed to use in their program. It was mm -hmm. called, and it's a good movie. Gotcha. And basically, it goes through what happens to somebody that, you know, tried to expose the program back then. Back then, Tim Robbins is in it, Jason Alexander. Okay. Good I movie. know that uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, who wrote about the, uh, who wrote The Brave New World and who's, who was the brother of Julian Huxley, who was the founder of UNESCO. He, um, he talked about before he committed suicide on the same day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And he did so publicly with video, you know, and he took mega doses of LSD um, and wanted to make a statement, but of course it got drowned out by the assassination. But he wrote an essay shortly before that, where he talked about the world living in a chemical concentration camp as the future yeah. you know that everybody would be on some kind of controlled substance of you know if not multiple controlled substances that would regulate something and and including their psyche and uh, i think that to a certain extent that has become true i mean if you take a look at the number of people who are on some oh kind God. of a prescription drug by the way my in, in disclosure myself included i mean you know because I, I take a high blood pressure pill you know, the, everyone is on something, you know. Pharmaceuticals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a pharmaceutical uh, concentration camp in a way. Yeah. Did you ever hear of Citizens Commission for Human Rights? No. I filed complaints with them back, I think, in the early 90s for psychiatric abuse, for the fabricated mental illness uh, cases and things like that. And their big thing is trying to, you know, reduce these, psych these kids that are given these psychiatric meds for ADHD. I mean, they're diagnosing kids right and left, and then right away they're putting them on these psychotronic drugs, and that's not yeah. good. Well, my, my good friend, the late Dr. Samuel L. Blumenfeld, who was the author of a, a shelf of books on education, he wrote about how um, the uh, educrats, you know, starting with John Dewey back in the early 20th century, the so-called frontier thinkers, the progressives, took 
cognitive learning and turned it over into behavioral learning. And yeah. they use things like look, say reading and other technologies that would actually create ADD and create dyslexia and create social problems for young people whose brains were affected by this, who could not read properly because English is a phonetic language. They took out phonics. And um, he, he basically traces brilliant job, great man. I spent hundreds of hours interviewing him. Um, he traces a lot of our mind control, our docile population, our ability to accept authority to this agenda because that's exactly what they intended to do. Yeah. Well, they, you know, back then in the 60s, they, the CIA flooded the streets with LSD. Yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, yeah. Out in LA. Another guy I interviewed, Jim Keith, who was the author of Mind Control, World Control, who uh, I, I might note uh, passed away under mysterious circumstances, questionable circumstances, um, came, went into a hospital with a minor problem and he never came out. Let's just put it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, he talks about this. He did a lot of research on this, and he was just a, a, a mainstream reporter. He wasn't some, you know, political guy. I mean, he fell into the subject, and he went deep and, and researched it. Did you ever uh, hear the theory regarding the natural lithium in the water? Uh, no. I mean, I've heard about what fluoride. Is, well, I was when I was in prison in 2019, I managed to get a radio legally and I used to listen to Coast to Coast George Norrie at night. Oh yeah, sure. He had, he had a psychiatrist on and they did a study in El Paso, Texas. And basically the town was split in half. The one town had a high concentrate of natural lithium in the water, mm -hmm. drinking water. Right. The other the other part of the town didn't. Now the one with the nat uh, high levels of natural lithium had lower suicide rates lower crime rate. Now, of course, lithium is what's used to treat bipolar, mood disorder, manic depression. Right. And, and the other town where it was low had high crime, high violence, a lot of murders. Sure. And it was peer reviewed. They, they did a peer reviewed study mm -hmm. in a psychiatric journal. And now, if you saw on the news the other night, they were gonna strip mine all the lithium out of the earth for battery. Oh my. Now, I what's mean, that uh, going to do? You know, by the way, I think Perrier water, French Perrier water has natural lithium in it, um, from what I've heard. So, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. It's a natural resource. Yeah. Um, and and uh, they're going to, boy, huh. The, uh, yeah, these are strange events. The other strange event that um, is making news on that one is the, the um, I guess that it's, um, Oh, I, I lost my train of thought. Anyways, go go on. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, the Capitol riot. Yes. Now, I, re I studied those and I recorded the news every day for like a month since the riot, including the day of. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what's going on with the people that were arrested, a lot of them military, some police. Yeah. I, my theory is, is that they were hit with microwaves. They were charged up. Who that was? The crowd was charged. The crowd. Now, with microwaves, if you talk, if you listen to the experts like Dr. Robert Duncan, who helped develop these technologies, he's a whistleblower now. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you they can actually pick latitude and longitude and hit everyone within that latitude and longitude with microwaves. Just give them enough of an edge to get them enough, get them angry enough. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, where they don't really notice, and I think that's what is going on. Well, you know, it also might have just been, it's the psychology of a mob that people lose their own sense of reason and they become like a group, it's, it becomes like a wolf pack. Yeah, well, I, I think it goes beyond that. And you know, they just came out with this, this lawsuit against Trump not too long ago, and I'm, I'm following an amicus on that case for mm -hmm. him saying that he wasn't really the culprit in egging those people on. It was other technologies that were yeah. no, I th at, I least, that, at least, you know, in I part. think that it's something that even the um, the mainstream media is now admitting after studies by the FBI and by 
other agencies that is certainly the, the main responsibility for the whole thing lies with Nancy Pelosi and that the Capitol Police knew well in advance that there was going to be some crazies in, in this peaceful rally that would try to do this. And they decided oh, not yeah. to do anything about it because according to the Sergeant at Arms who, who answers to Pelosi, who is responsible for security at the U.S. Capitol, that, that they would, um, they didn't like the optics of it. So they didn't wow. have, you know, the, apparently the shields and the other type of things that they normally would have were locked away somewhere. They didn't have access to it. They, they didn't have, you know, any, you know, what, what normally would be a preparation for this. I mean, this would, there was just very little security on a day when you had practically the entire government gathered in, in the Congress. I mean, like, I mean, here in Boston, for example, I mean, I had to, about a year ago, I had to get a renewal on my passport. And to do that, I had to go to the federal building here in Boston, the big one, the Tip O'Neill building in downtown Boston. And just to get in, I mean, I had to take off my belt and my shoes and I had to put my wallet and my cell phone into a bin and have it scanned. And then I had to walk through a scanner and, you know, they had a, a wand. I mean, the security was intense. And that's not, I mean, this is, we're not, we're just talking about a regular federal building in Boston. In this case, we're talking about the U.S. Capitol building, the most important federal building in the country. Well, I, I think, it, I like think there, was a de, there was a three-hour delay in the National Guard getting called. I mean, the yep. National Guard were alerted the night before. The night before, okay. Yeah, I think the night before, I mean, yeah, they, they knew something was going to happen. I mean, and it just... <laughs> It's that's what happens in a lot of mass shootings. The right. Shooters are interviewed by FBI, or they had a mental health warrant before, and not nothing really happens to them. And then they end up, you know, going out and performing the, their duty, so to speak, the killing. And the same thing happened at the Capitol. Right. Right. I mean, the only killing was the point blank killing of Ashley Babbitt. Um, in in a shooting that really has never been explained, um, you know, they, in a way, I don't know why why um, the mobs aren't up in arms about that. It's interesting, right? Yeah. But, but whatever. I mean, that's that's the world we're in right now. So, Stan, um, you you know, you, where are where is your case right now? And what can, do you want anyone they're listening to do anything? Can they help you in any way? Yeah, I could use a wheelchair. I, you know, I I I. Um, tried to get an electric wheelchair in December. I qualified for it. My insurance company said no problem. In fact, I didn't have to pay a penny for it. You know, I still don't have a wheelchair. Yeah. They fight. I mean, I can't get anything. I mean, do you have do you have family members? Anybody? Are you alone? I mean, do you have people helping you? No, at all? my my. They turned my family against me back in in the eighties. That's the first thing they do. The first thing they do is turn your family against. Your family, friends, relatives. I mean, the propaganda is incredible. You know, how they perform these games. They're called containment programs. You know, when you're high value target, like, like I am. Mm -hmm. That's explained by Barbara Hotwell. She's a PSYOP whistleblower from the CIA. And, you know, she's pretty familiar with these programs. And, you know, between the propaganda and the containment, I'm pretty much alone, you know. Oh, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I but I'm used. To, I'm used to it, so it doesn't bother. I hope that maybe you can reach out and do some rapprochement. I mean, it's still there's always the human element to it. Oh, sure. I mean, I'm you know, as long as you can't win in court unless you're in court, and I'm still in court, so okay. you know. Stan, do you want to give out any information uh, so people can contact you or or not? Yeah, my uh, my Twitter page is under Advanced Media Group, and I also have a YouTube channel under my name, Sam J. Catterbell. But they're, they're the only two social media. And LinkedIn. Which is where I, which and LinkedIn, LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, right. right. LinkedIn under my name. All right, Stan. Well, listen, let's stay in touch. Please keep me posted as things develop. I'd like to hear from you again. And um, thank you very much for joining me. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. Okay. Have a good one. Welcome to the program, Charles Moskowitz, Monday through Friday, 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Stan Ketterbone is here. He's back for a return visit so we can check in with his uh, his case. I don't really want to specifically talk about 
your your pro se law case stand, but I do want to talk as a matter of public interest in your story of how you have been persecuted as a whistleblower by very some very heavy-handed government action. So uh, give us a give us a quick thumbnail on what's the latest with your case, with, with what you're going through. Well, the latest is that I'm still litigating in several courts. I virtually don't have access. I mean, my mail's tampered with and orders I don't receive. I don't know if the clerks don't send them or what. And um, I guess I probably have about eight cases that are active and live regarding litigation, regarding COINTELPRO and uh, mind control and uh, things like that. Um, the whistleblowing, just to give you a brief rundown, the whistleblowing started in 1987 when I blew the whistle on a firm called ISC, International Signal Control, uh, who was a defense contractor who was selling uh, weapons, most uh, notably to Saddam Hussein, the cluster bomb that they developed and patented. And they, so were, I blew the whistle. About, they were doing that behind the back of Congress and, and the government, right? No. They were actually doing it in sync with the NSA and the CIA. I see. They they tied the CIA into it. But did Congress uh, know about it? I mean, did uh, the no? It it was a black ops. It was you know a quiet okay. program. Understood. So it was covert. It was covert. So but they the were problem, doing arms deals to the, to uh, Saddam Hussein in the 1980s, and you were a uh, working as a contractor that had an affiliation with that uh, with the arms deal. You blew the whistle on it. Well, I had built a financial firm, and they had come to. I was already a shareholder since 1982. Right. And I built a financial firm, and they wanted me to finance some operations. So I called some public officials up and raised hell, and they came down on me hard with Contel Pro like tactics. But what I didn't know back then is my father was already a victim of MK Ultra, and so was my brother. So I attracted the attention of Intel, DOD, and everybody else, as well as FBI and people like that. Okay, so this was at a time when MK Ultra was already being somewhat exposed. There was the church committee hearings in the late 1970s. Um, MK Ultra, in a nutshell, was a CIA program launched back in the 1940s, officially, that um, that basically dealt with issues of psyop psy mind control um, manipulation that there were experiments done on people um, this the most famous one of which there was a television movie and that was uh, the Olson case where they put LSD in his coffee and he committed suicide and and other similar operations in the 1960s they were involved with Timothy Leary and Ram Das and psychologist Dr. Julian West basically distributing LSD you know, in, in the street, you know, getting people as a, as a public experiment. So, you know, this was all part of this, um, you know, various means of manipulating people. You know, it's, it's kind of, I guess that maybe by today's standards, there could be some similarities drawn at least philosophically with the transhumanism movement. Yeah, it's the the program was supposed to have been shut down in 73, 74 with the church hearings. Right. But essentially what they did was they moved the program to the Department of Defense, uh, covertly, black ops programs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the programs are continued uh, against the, the knowledge of Congress purposefully. Uh, you see what they do with whistleblowers who speak out about this. They, we all get persecuted. Right. tortured, imprisoned, and, and the like. Yeah, we were supposed to, at that time, we, we were supposed to have whistleblower laws to protect people like you who were blowing the whistle. It sounds to me that the only whistleblower that's ever really been protected was the one that claimed that um, he talked to someone third hand who had heard a conversation between President Trump and the uh, Ukrainian premier. He has absolute protection. He's fine. <laughs> you even mentioned yeah. his name in public, you could be banned. I mean, uh, I think uh, Senator, Senator Rand Paul actually mentioned his name in the well of the U.S. Senate during public hearings, and he was banned. So, 
if you're not him, and we're not mentioning his name here, you don't get protection, and you certainly haven't, uh, Stan. No, I've been in prison four times, uh, four or five times. I've had eight, I think, psychiatric mental health warrants served on me. That's what they do. It, it, it's a big propaganda campaign uh, at you at the same time. And then in 2005, they started hitting me with the microwaves, electronic weapons uh, for the torture and, and the telepathy and things like that. Talk now you see what they're going to do. About that, Stan. What, what do you mean electronic waves and telepathy? Well, in 2005, I filed my first federal lawsuit to try to bring closure and try to get uh, restored the whole, so to speak. I, I was extorted out of millions and millions of dollars, businesses, financial assets, real estate assets. So in 2005, when I filed my first federal lawsuit, uh, they hit me with the microwaves electronic weapons the same thing what that was that like it, i mean how did that what what how do you know this i mean what happened well first of all i be, i became telepathic synthetic telepathy is a is a signature of some of these programs mm -hmm. where they use your mind uh they sync your mind up to a computer to other people they can instill pain and inflict pain in any parts of your body i'm crippled up i need a wheelchair that's all from the weapons. Um, and like I say, the telepathy with me is 24 seven, hasn't stopped for a second since 2005. It's a hard and, show, I mean, it's terrible. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I feel nervous talking to you about this. This is terrible. Well, well, fortunately I saw my father go through this, some of this. Now he, he received the electroshock therapy. They brainwashed him with electroshock, sent him on different missions overseas to the Middle East and Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was called what's co called a covert courier. Right. When they hypnotize them, they send them over there and deliver messages to other, other spies. That way, if they get caught, they're not going to know anything. They're not going to be able to divulge any secrets or who they are, really. And I have his passports that I saved, that he saved, uh, to prove all that out. Now in 2009, I was able to collect social security disability for being a victim of mind control. And they awarded me benefits going back to 05 when I declared that December of 05 is when I became full-time telepathic. Before that, it was on and off. So I was able to collect disability uh, benefits. Now I haven't been able to win any civil actions in court, uh, but I have won judgments where in the third circuit where they allowed me to in other words, all my cases were, uh, uh, attorneys tried to dismiss the cases, and I won the Third Circuit, they sent them back for further litigation. Then I withdrew without prejudice because I don't have access to the courts. You know, it sounds like- yeah, I'm struggling with the courts and getting- Yeah, guy. Um, all right, is that all right. I'm getting an echo. Getting an echo. Um, but it sounds to me like you were struggling with the courts ever since 19, 95 or 2005 i should say well and, actually in 87 i in 87 i tried to go to the courts and back then they they you know they uh went after the attorneys they just lined the attorneys up against me and i tried to hire well you're not you're now trying, i do i do the whistle like you're getting any justice in the courts for you trying to get justice in the courts would have been like the pre the trump administration getting a hearing on voter irregularities which of course the courts refused to hear and, oh yeah. A, well, the thing is, I think, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. If you think you're going to get justice in the courts, you're putting yourself through something that's probably an exercise in futility because they're not going to do it. They're going to find a way to not hear your case. They're going to some technicality, just like what they did to President Trump. We're not going to ever get you before a judge in a courtroom with a public hearing where you'll have you know people actually acts you know cross-examining and listening to the evidence and checking it out i don't think you're going to get that far because it's going to be shut down on technicalities before you get in the door so i guess that my question to you therefore stan is for the sake of your you know the use of your energy and the use of your time i don't know you might be better off just you know writing a book and 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 going oh. forward in the media and Forget about the courts because you're not going to get any. It's like hitting your head against a wall. 
Well, that's not necessarily true. I'll tell you why, because my cases involve antitrust litigation okay. outside of the mind control and everything else. And I've been successful in keeping my cases going in the courts. And that's what keeps me alive. They tried to kill me several times. They killed my father and my brother, two brothers. My mom buried two sons. All questionable suicides that were fabricated and set up. So what happened? What happened? I stay alive by staying in the courts. Okay. No, it then, gives me then, a layer of protection. Then stay in the courts, you know. I mean, it's just I mean, if you're being persecuted in that way, gee, I mean that's that's critical. Yeah, if I wouldn't be in the courts, I'd be dead. There's no doubt about it. So you really you know, they, have, yeah. They fill my house with toxic air on a regular basis. I have four exhaust fans I have to run. I mean, I gag, choke, spit up, toxic air, poison. Well, I hope you have some good air purifiers. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, I, I used to use those, but now I just use exhaust fans. Okay. I mean, the whole, the subject is, is scary. It makes me feel paranoid, you know, I just... Um, <laughs> You know, they can read anybody's mind they want, the NSA. So I mean, they, have that, was, they have that kind of technology now? Yeah, remote neural monitoring. I mean, you've got commercial companies doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You've got Elon Musk's company, Neuralink. He reverse engineered the, the CIA chip that they use for mind control. Oh, I don't doubt that for a minute. Um, yeah. Stan, what can we do as average citizens who want to you know live our lives as sovereign citizens and you know expressing our opinions and, and um, how can we counteract this as individuals can or can we well here's the problem you look at julian assange yes his case now you know he should be freed of course he was a whistleblower right now i was curious to see how the biden administration was going to handle it and apparently there's no change from Trump to Biden as far as whistleblowers. Trump was hard on whistleblowers. Okay. Very hard. His administration. You know, he came out during his campaign in 2016 before he was elected and went on a record and said he thought Snowden should be executed. Yeah. So, and, and you know, I don't know. No better than but, anyone else. I get it. And Trump, you know, Trump went to military school. Sure. Yeah. Way back. So, so then his administration was not any better than previous or present in terms no, of No, but the ironic thing is is that it looks like his administration was subject to a lot of their tactics, which is kind of crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean a lot of there's a lot of similarities between how I was treated and how he was treated with the FBI and things like that. And you well, know, he can the FBI he complained I think, about being surveilled. The FBI, and I mean, I would suggest that they, they were very political and very biased in terms of their their anti-Trump positions and um, helping the uh, basically have him remove from office. I mean, it seems to me, I would argue, and I'm not saying all of the agents, I'm talking about just the leadership. I mean, this this guy, Christopher Wray, is just a protege of Comey and, and, yeah. and Robert Mueller and, and other of these sort of highly political insider deep state corrupted you know type of people yeah it's it's a it's a, a widely corrupted system if you if you take out the uh, conspiracy theory words and the paranoia words and look at the deep state as far as what actually goes on there's a good video out called shadowgate mm -hmm. it's by two whistleblowers and it just, you know, gives you an example of how deep state this stuff is and how heavily surveilled society is without even knowing it. Oh, you know, then, that's interesting. You know, I, mean, I think it goes all the way back. I mean, it's uh, and, you know, if you talk about this now and you talk about the election and I, I don't even want to talk about it because I'll be banned on YouTube. My only point is that if you criticize the past election, you are called a quote unquote conspiracy theorist in a very right. scornful way, like that there is something wrong with you mentally for, for being, you know, thinking there might have been something wrong politically with that election. But but at the same time, the same people that are saying that 
had, you know, we're hatching what I would suggest is the biggest conspiracy theory in politics over the past maybe 50 years. And that is that Donald Trump was a spy for Russia. Yeah, and, I do. And that the Russians, you know, put him in office. I mean, talk about denying an election. But, yeah. but I mean, you know, that, we'll, we'll put that aside. I mean, that's just an observation there. No, I just, you know, I have another outlook. Like I said, I grew up in a, you know, uh, conducting business in a financial arena. I did business all over the world with when I helped pioneer the CD-ROM industry. And, you know, it's a global marketplace today. Mm -hmm. We all do business with each other. And, you know, this mentality that Russia, Russia is always the enemy just doesn't work economically anymore. I mean, it's not realistic. No. Because it is such a global marketplace. Well, yes, and, and and I even in that context, I think that Trump tried to put America first in many ways, at least philosophically, by trying to balance the trade deficit and and yeah, he did. You're right. As a way to protect American labor and American industry, which is something that is classic sovereign rights of any nation to do, and most nations. Well, I, do this. I think a good observation with Trump is that. He was always the first to want to talk and meet with anyone, which previous administrations wouldn't do. I mean, as okay. far as Kim Jong Un and you know North Korea, and you know he did a lot with North Korea. He got North Korea and South Korea together. He did, and he also we should remember that even though you and know, the Middle he, East, it didn't ha he didn't get everything. I mean, nevertheless, no. the North Koreans were lobbing missile tests over the Sea of Japan almost monthly for a while there. Yeah, well, I know. Uh, and then weekly there for a while. Yeah, and they've completely stopped that. So, you know, a lot was done, and a lot was done in the Middle East, of course. There was, now we're back to the policy of war. Now we're, uh, as we speak, we're dropping bombs in Syria. You know, we're ramping up the, yeah, old, yeah. the old policy that was originally talked about by historian Charles Austin Beard in the 1920s when he wrote the book Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace. That has been the American policy since World War One. You know, just constant involvement in these endless, senseless international wars as a way, I think, of weakening our, our sovereignty and expanding this kind of informal uh, international order, what they now call the Great Reset. Yeah, there's just so much money spent on weapons. It's such a huge industry. Well, that's something you were very intimately huge involved industry. in. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. In that's fact, taxpayer money. In fact, in 1990, I was one of four CD ROM manufacturing facilities in the country, in the world, really, in the country. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was bidding on a Department of Defense contract. It was me, Sony, and Philip DuPont, those two companies built CD technology and one other company. And we were putting uh, maps of the Middle East, digitizing them and putting them on CD-ROMs. Mm -hmm. Now we were a secure facility so we could do classified work. And the Department of Defense cheated against me, the small guy. Mm -hmm. And I filed a protest and Congressman Robert Walker was my liaison and I beat the Department of Defense in a protest. We had to rebid re the whole contract over. So I've been through contracts on both sides as a whistleblower and performing defense contract. So then you've been you've you've served both sides of the uh, of the aisle, yeah. so to speak. And yeah. um, I mean, I I just uh, you know what you're going through is really really troubling and. Um, it's There's a, a lot of people of, like me out there going through the same thing. Yes, there is. In fact, uh, a lot of you mentioned MK Ultra. There are a lot of people who uh, have done interviews about this, who went through it. Um, you know, Oper Operation Butterfly and 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 this you know, Monarch and all that stuff. You know, right. child sex trafficking and and just really really ugly stuff. That that. Um, I mean, one of the things that's troubling me right now with the uh, Biden administration, and then Trump tried to stop this and did to a certain extent, is that they're lowering those prosecutions of sex traffickers. They're saying they're not going to deport foreign illegal aliens who are accused of sex trafficking and, and crimes. And we're just going to see more of it, especially now that children are coming across the border. Yeah, that's a big problem, the sex trade. 
Yeah. That's a huge and that's a huge industry. The black market sex trade. And and kids and adults. Yes. You know, with immigrants and, and things like that. That's right. I mean, it's people who are obviously vulnerable and they can be uh, taken advantage of. Yeah, sex is a sex is a weapon. I mean, they but, use it against me, sex. Did they? Yeah, look at I mean Jeffrey Epstein. Um, I don't think it's any secret. It's been reported by mainstream media that he was connected to the uh, to the CIA and possibly other foreign intelligence agencies. These things yeah. are gigantic secret societies that are legal and that that function in in the in the shadows. And uh, you know, they, I don't know what what the deal is with that. We only know the tip of the iceberg. Now, did you ever see? Uh... The JFK speech from secret societies. Yes, I have, and it's That's a uh, very good fantastic. speech. Fantastic. And by the way, yeah. uh, I and I and I reported on it, repeat, re, you know, republished it in my book on assassination, and um, it's published on the JFK Library website. This isn't some conspiracy theory. This, yeah, I I retweeted a lot too. Oh yeah, I mean, this is something that you know that it's not hidden. I mean, it's out there. And Kennedy lays it out in clear and unequivocal terms, the dangers of secret societies and how they're functioning in a way that is contrary to the interests of the country. I mean, this isn't new. This is Let me ask you a question. What do you think he was referring to? Who well, I, mean, to? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. Oh, but, you know the military industrial, what, what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. I mean, Eisenhower made those comments on the last, on the evening before he left office. You notice yeah. to the very, very end, when his final address, he warned the country about the quote military industrial complex. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know exactly what it is and who it is, but you know, President Trump called it the deep state. Um, uh, Michael, Professor Michael Glennon of the Fletcher School, calls it the double government. He wrote a book about this. Yeah. Who knows? Shadow government. Shadow government. Yeah. I mean, um, pre going back into the 19th century, I mean, I think it was President uh, Martin Van Buren referred to the money power. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's been referred to by different things. Yeah. it's Today, the lines are so blurred because of social media and technology that it's hard to keep track of. It is. And, um, you know, we, we can't know because we're not part of it. I mean, only the only people who know, the, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, I, I, I often refer to uh, Whitaker Chambers, who was, who was a communist in the 1930s and who managed people inside the FDR administration for, this, for the Communist Party and who eventually left the party because he became Christian and because he was upset that um, Stalin had allied himself with Hitler. That was the final straw for him. And, and he writes in his fantastic autobiography, Witness, about a quote conspiracy of gentlemen he calls it in other words he's, he's not saying it isn't a, a a clique of people who sit around in a smoke-filled room and, and plot stuff it's more kind of a a group of high level elites in the government in business in media in in banking in culture even at the church who think alike and who believe, have the same beliefs and who have almost a a code means of communicating with each other. They don't have to sit around in meetings. They all know what to right. do. They all believe yeah. the same thing. They're all trying to get to the same ends. Exactly. Using different means. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, did you ever cover Devos? No. Uh, it, no, what's, what's the deal? No. The annual oh, meeting. That, oh, mean, yeah, the, oh, yeah, sure. Davos they, and the well, you know, they're the ones that, that coined the phrase, the the, uh, the Great Reset. And I think it was early in uh, 2019, they had a massive meeting that included world leaders, world yeah. leaders figures. Uh, I think that Bill Gates was there. I mean, not to mention names, but they a lot of major figures. And um, and this guy Schwab has been pushing for this thing. And they, they put up a video of that meeting, which went viral immediately, and then they deleted it. Yeah, I but, saw. I think I saw it. Yeah. 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 But but they're the but the uh, they're talking about the Great Reset, and these are people who, 
you know, it's not that they want to have like a world government. I mean, I don't agree with maybe the John Birch Society's analysis on that. I think it's that they want an informal government of the world, not one where you, you know, where they leave in place all the governments and they leave in place the trappings of government, but they informally and quietly run the show. I mean, in, yeah. in countries around the world. And, and so you have to look at what they were about. And I think that the Great Reset, basically they said that they want the United States to be subordinated and weakened so that we could become a uh, sort of a province of the world. They want to see socialism. They want to, you know, they're, they're using environmental emergency fear tactics to get people to surrender, to like to stop eating meat. I don't know, you know, different things like that. You know, yeah, if you listen to Dr. Robert Duncan, he's a scientist and he helped develop some of these programs. Mm -hmm. He worked for DARPA, CIA, Department of Justice, and he essentially says, you know, the same thing about, you know, all these uh, secret societies and things like that, that they're actually dumbing down society. They dumb society. Oh, yeah. Education. Where, yeah. I mean, they've got, you know, education has gone from a cognitive system where, where young people have learned how to think of themselves. And, right. And to, uh, this is nothing new, behaviorism. My good friend, the late Dr. Samuel Blumenfeld wrote a whole ton of books about this. He did many, many hundreds of hours with me on the air. I consider him to be my mentor. And he talked about how even as early as the 19th century with John Dewey, they were starting with, you know, getting rid of phonics and getting rid of you know, systematic learning and replacing it with um, methodologies that lead to uh, to ADD and and the disconnect and the illiteracy and and all kinds of social problems and doing so deliberately, doing yeah. so because they want to create what the Rockefellers called human resources, not human beings. Human, we're like just resources, people that could punch a time clock and not think too much and be somewhat docile and be happy with entertainment and what the Romans called the bread and circus. And, and that, uh, you know, that, that agenda of the corporatists like Rockefeller combined with the leftists like uh, John Dewey who wanted a world socialism and a utopian, you know, dumbed down ant colony, they worked together hand in glove to create this new uh, type of person. And, and now we're seeing it. We're seeing the, pro the, the results of it. What well, do you look at yeah. Look, look at Pink Floyd's song, The Wall. Yeah. That, that describes just what you said. That's right. We don't need no education. We don't need no, right. <laughs> we don't need no mind control. Yeah. What What do you think, Stan, about the, um, the present um, um, pandemic? I mean, I'm listening to um, Steve Bannon in his show, The War Room, and he's got you know, epidemiologists on, he's been banned from YouTube. I don't even know. I, I probably shouldn't even post this show on YouTube. I probably won't. But he, um, you know, he's been banned. And, and yet he has people on who are saying that the thing was created in a lab and that it's a biological weapon and that uh, the political coordination around it is one that weakens the Western democracies, it weakens the United States. It, it causes people to live in a condition of virtual martial law. We're willing to give up our freedoms. You have to cover our faces. It's almost like a burqa when you go out. And um, what, what say you on that? Well, you know, the Chinese opened up the lab to inspectors, and they still haven't sourced the, the origin of the virus. Well, according to that the people that Lee Cannon has on, the virus is not behaving like a natural virus. It's not the same thing as the Spanish flu or, or other other viruses which do happen there are certain things about it there are certain markers that that indicate that it's it's something that is artificial yeah i mean the, the technology for nanoparticles and just the whole nanotechnology you know raises questions in itself as far as the virus and the other thing is that when we were talking about dumbing down society how many people in this country get their news from social media rather than network news. I mean, that's a big problem as far as the virus, people not believing the virus is really real. 
Well, it is very unless real. Watch, telling people. In, it is, but unless you watch network news, who knows what you're going to believe? You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. But, of course, the problem is that, um, I mean, social media, and this is something that I'm struggling with because I do it, it is becoming increasingly um, censored. Let's just put it that way. I mean, if they can censor the sitting president of the United States and, and remove him from being able to send out Twitter, then then they censor a poor schmo like me. I mean, it's you know, it's it's sort of like you don't get you know you, you know you you don't get um, this kind of information. Well, here's the problem: you take the big tech companies, Google, Amazon, on and on. They're all defense contractors. That's and a lot of them are doing work for intelligence with clouds and things like that. And they heard, control all the this. information. Didn't that Google have a large portion of their business comes from <clears throat> renting their cloud to uh, the Department of Defense? Amazon, that's where Amazon's profits come from. The yeah. defense side, AWS, as opposed yeah. to the storefront. Yeah, I mean, and they took down Parler at a time when Parler was actually um, gaining on Twitter, and it was a much freer platform. And, you know, somehow they used the excuse that Parler had something on that advocated violence, which was untrue. And at the same time, Facebook and Twitter, I mean, they have, they have child porn. I mean, they've got all kinds of stuff on there that's, you know, really, really, you know, nasty, and they don't care. They're making money. Yeah, you, you look at between Facebook, Amazon, Google, and a couple other ones, they're the, they're the giants in the tech world, and they control all the information. They do. Private information on people. And that's that's too small of a space. Yeah, you know what I mean? They control the means of... For that much data. And that's right. the problem. That's the problem. Oh, absolutely. I mean... All you need to do is deal with four people as far as censorship. You know what I mean? As opposed to maybe 20. People no, it's, it's very difficult and, you know, it's very discouraging for people, you know, like myself and others who are trying to conduct sure. views. And I've already had, like, for example, my, my YouTube channel was I'm, I'm suspended from doing live interviews for, for seven days because a guest of mine last week made a comment about the vaccine. He didn't say not to do the vaccine. Neither do I. I probably am going to do it. I know members of my family have done it. It's fine. But he just brought up something that had to do with some of the um, the after effects of it amongst a certain segment of the population, which I'm not going to name. And, um, you know, my opinion, my thoughts are that we should go forward, but we should do it with information. We should do it with being informed on any kind of medical procedure. Almost so, definitely. But there's something about that subject that you cannot criticize yeah. it. It, uh, it makes me suspicious about maybe who's profiting from it, who has an agenda. It's kind of, you know, when, when something is like that is censored, which is a very mild and normal statement. And uh, so the re response that I've had is that I've, I'm setting up, I'm doing the best I can on a, on a shoestring, but I've set up a, a separate website under my own name, charlesmoskowitz.com where I have something like, at this point, about 30 different platforms besides YouTube that carry my broadcast every day, uh, both live stream and archived. And so I'm hoping that if they pull one down, then there'll be the others because I am determined to do this. I mean, I suppose yeah. ultimately they could just pull the plug on the whole thing. I recognize that. Um, well, back in college, in college, one of my classes was the book 1984, the whole class, the whole yeah. semester. And look, we're, look where we're at. And that was in 1980. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, they're, talk, they're talking about actually having, I mean, there's been a congresswoman from, I think, Washington State, who is recommending that there literally be a, uh, a minister of truth. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Yeah. You, did you? Yeah, right. It's up right out of 1984. And, yeah, and they right. want to ban you know, anyone who doesn't genuflect to the left from all social media. I mean, it's it's really that ugly. I don't think they're going to get away with that in this country, but I could be wrong. You know, it's going to get, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And you have people like myself and like others who are literally 
starting to set up an alternative uh, economy and alternative culture. You know, the, now that we know that Amazon is burning books and, and, and quietly deleting books from their site, and I'm the author of several books on Amazon, so I'm worried about that. People are finding alternative publishing houses, alternative vehicles. You know, there, there's, you've got Rumble and you've got, you've got Mines and you've got Gab and you've got all these other things. And, and so it, I think what's happening is we're going to have like a, a vivisection of our culture in this country with one side almost only, you know, communicating completely yeah. off the grid. And um, I mean, ultimately, I think that there are going to be so many people who are going to be involved in it that they're going to co-opt the establishment, or they go, or the establishment is going to have to absorb them, uh, one or the other. It's not going. To, it's not possible that they continue because ultimately, these these bigger venues have to make a buck. And if you have a growing number of people who are dropping out, they're going to have yeah. to. They'll have to change. I hope. I mean, there's already something like 20 states that are now saying to uh, Facebook and, and Twitter and that they cannot censor conservative opinion. They can't take right. on websites. With all, there's always like a glitch. Yeah. The glitch is always in their favor. It's like, I mean, Senator right. Senator always Blackburn, she had all of her social media taken off five, five weeks before the election for the U.S. Senate. She's the Republican nominee in Tennessee. She won a race anyway, but that, you know, they said, oh, we're so sorry. This was a glitch. Really? You know, it's always, you know, it's always <laughs> convenient. So And always in their favor. Well, it's funny that the truth is now like a commodity. You know what I mean? As in opposed to like this being what it is. As yeah. opposed to being what it used to be, the truth. Yeah. I mean, you know, now somebody has to own the truth or censor it or filter it or review it. It's crazy. Absolutely. So Stan, anyway, getting back to your case, I mean, I'm hoping for success for you. You know, you've been out there, you've been, you've suffered, your family has, has been terrible, has undergone terrible uh, situations, including possible murder. Um, where are you now and where are you going to be, where are you going with it? Well, as long as I'm alive, I'm fine. I know how to make do. I mean, I, you know, I make the best of it. Mm. I have interests that I still pursue and I'm totally isolated from everyone, relatives, everyone. I mean, that's part of the game. The people have cut off contact with you, or you just for this? Well, no, they, they're they all part of the propaganda campaign. All they do is lie about me and tell 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 everyone I'm crazy and treat me like I'm crazy. You know what I mean? And with my resume, I mean, I started in computers in 1975, aced every computer class in high school and college, had four three programming languages in college, aced them all, Fortran, Basic, and COBOL. And 1975 is when Steve Jobs and Bill Gates started. We all started about the same time. So I know technology. Oh, sorry, yeah. Well, I hope that you stay in the game in that score and you know continue to uh, develop uh, your technological skills because um, the future, I think, is going to be outside of the big tech. You know, it's, it's going to uh, be people creating independent entities. I mean, the, the, one of the pioneers in that would be Alex Jones. And I'm not here to endorse Alex Jones. I think. Yeah, I know. I know Alex. What happened? I don't know in person, but no, I know. But he's, and he's made, some, he's made some major mistakes, and he's had the the response to that has been lawsuits, and he should pay the yeah. price. However, you know, he's. Uh, He's been purged. He was the first one to be purged. And his response was that he's built his own network completely independent of any of the uh, of the cloud or anything else. And uh, and he's now going forward with that and building it. So, you know, maybe he's I mean, he's got the resources to do it, but maybe that's like the canary in the mine shaft, you know. Yeah, he doesn't express popular opinions for the establishment, but he's moving forward and he's developing this. What I'm talking about, this alternative universe that we're developing. Well, that's how this country was built. The Industrial Revolution was like that. Entrepreneurs, you know, yes. people inventing things, Absolutely. you know. And we Absolutely. can't let that go. And that's what they're trying to, you know, put down. 
they're trying to deindustrialize the country. Sure. I mean, this was the American system of, of Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay. In fact, I'm having Anton Chatkin come up on the show, who's, who's written a book about this. Good guy, good historian. And, uh, you know, it's being dismantled. And Trump tried to bring it back. It's, yeah. uh, you know, I think even FDR tried to bring it back. It's not just a, this isn't a Democrat Republican thing. I mean, this is uh, an American thing. Right. It's an American thing. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so Stan, where do you want to let our, our listeners and viewers know anything about uh, about you know where they can help you or, or websites or anything like that? They can go to my Twitter page. It's under Advanced Media Group, and I'm also on LinkedIn under my name, Stan J. Catterbone. Those two, I I had a website. They shut it down. They essentially stole my domain site domain name when I was in prison in 2019. So that I you know, I don't even try to get back to it. I'm so hacked. Every electronic device I have is hacked. Uh you know, I wipe my computers, I could wipe them every other day. They're hacked up so much. I lose functionality and things like that. But my my Twitter page and LinkedIn are the best ways uh to get to the information. Okay. Well, listen, uh, Stan, stay in touch with me and we should uh, keep me posted on any developments. And yes, I will, certainly. We'll, we'll talk again. All right. Thank you very much, Charles. All right, Stan Catabone, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's amazing what you can do, you know. Oh, I know. I mean, of course, I have to be careful in a lot of the censorship and all that, but even in a way, that's one of the reasons I have so many simultaneous streams because if, if they take one down I'm, I'm, I'm going to be okay on the other one oh right presumably unless they pull the plug on the whole thing which is very possible <laughs> well I've had that happen yeah that could happen all right so here we go and we're live on YouTube thank you very much welcome to the program everyone Charles Moskowitz uh, Monday through Friday I do this thing let me just uh go to recording. Uh, Stan Caterbone is my guest. Stan, uh, I, I don't really want to get into some of the legal issues that you're grappling with right now as a pro se litigant, but I do want to talk about the background of um, what you describe as a, a revival of, if it ever went away, of the COINTELPRO program, which was run by the FBI in the early 1970s and it was used to infiltrate various organizations and harass various people who they who were seen as anti-government but you know it probably and it did overstep itself in terms of getting into people that were viewed as having unpopular opinion so um, it, let, let's start with that um, I mean even recently I saw a documentary about Native Americans in rock music uh, very interesting. And um, Buffy St. Marie, who was a Native American folk singer in the 1960s and 70s, had, you know, got through a Freedom of Information Act, got inf information which showed that she had been stymied by efforts of the FBI and other organizations to keep her from being too in the public eye. You know, it's kind of like uh, the old fashioned version of what we're dealing now with, which is shadow banning. I mean, uh, I've been told even that uh, my station on YouTube is shadow banned in that a couple of people who had subscribed to the station contacted me and said that they had been unsubscribed when they didn't do the unsubscribing. Somehow yeah. it just was dropped. That's and they common. Were wondering they weren't getting the videos. So, you know, I mean, the, the growth of my station on YouTube is, is extremely slow. And I think that I've been told that if this was not shadow banned, my station would be huge. And the same thing on TikTok. So that's the world we're living in right now. That's fine. I'm just glad to be doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm forging forward and I'm doing this right now on about 12 different streams. Um, and so I guess, Stan, why don't we start with your story of how this how this came about? I know that you, you draw heavily in your research from, from the Nick Begitz's library he uh, his father was uh, died under very suspicious circumstances i believe he was a congressman from alaska so so let's let's go right to it well uh 
my situation is a little more complicated. I'm a federal whistleblower. Okay. Back in 1987, I blew the whistle on a defense contractor who was from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It was called International Signal Control, or ISC. Mm -hmm. Now, I was a shareholder, and they solicited me to finance some of their operations. I had a meeting with them in June of 1987, and um, everyone came after me. Now, the problem is, is that I recorded a lot of public officials. I contacted a lot of federal agencies. Now, the problem is, is that four years later, Ted Koppel and ABC News broke the story that this company, International Signal and Control, or ISC, was a black ops program for the CIA and the NSA. Okay. This was May of 1991. Now, this was done by 60 Minutes, so we're not waving some conspiracy No, theory. Ted Koppel, ABC News. Ted Koppel, okay, Ted Koppel, ABC News, mainstream media. Oh, yeah. Uh, this isn't me saying this or you. This is something that's out there. Okay. Yes. Now, that summer, he did three programs on the subject matter. Now, at the time, Robert Gates, in September, Robert Gates was being confirmed for director of the CIA. Right. And they tied Robert Gates into international signal and control. Okay. Now, he did get confirmed, but then in December, ISC was indicted as the, one of the largest frauds in U.S. history. And essentially what they did was they did a merger in December of 87, right after I blew the whistle, with a company called Ferrani International from England one of their yeah. larger defense contractors. But they found out that ISC was making the cluster bombs for Saddam Hussein. They have oh. the patents. And they used a middleman, Carlos Cordoan from Chile, a okay. big defense contractor. So it got busted. They got indicted. And in the summer, in September of 87, they arrested me on four or five felonies and four misdemeanors for stealing my own files out of my own office at a financial firm, fairly large firm. We were in five or six different states. I built it. it. took me about a year and a half to build it. So anyway, so in March, they dismissed all the charges, the Lancaster County District Attorney's Office. But what happened is on the board of directors was Bobby Ray Inman. Oh, okay. He was former director of the NSA. He was director of naval intelligence, and he was the go-to guy for the contracts. So it was a huge scandal. So everybody went after me, the feds, local, state, and federal. But my father was Navy, and he was a victim of MK Ultra. Okay. And my brother, who was murdered on Christmas Day of 1984, was part of the same program. He was given LSD in the Air Force. Okay. So I kind of, my situation was triangulated by me blowing the whistle and then people trying to cover up my father and my brother being part of the mind control. So in two, essentially in 2005, I went into litigation, represented myself pro se, and then he hit me with electromagnetic weapons. All right, now let's, let's go over a couple of things here. First of all, um, I want to talk about MK Ultra a little bit, and I also want to talk about exactly what it was, Stan, that you were blowing the whistle about. But before we go to that, MK Ultra, there's been a lot written about this, a lot of the information about that operation, which was set up by the uh, CIA and the National Security Apparatus shortly after World War II was revealed during the church committee hearings in the late 1970s um, and uh, we were told that most of that was stopped at that point and this was an operation which worked and coincided with intelligence operations in in several other countries including great britain with the mi5 and canada that was engaging and uh, was engaging in experiments of mind control I don't think that's any question about that. That's history. 
We know about the case of Olson, who they gave a, a tab of LSD to without his knowing it, and he jumped out the window. There's no lawsuit about that. I think there was actually a movie made about that. And um, But it was much more expensive than that. It goes all the way up to the 1960s when psychiatrists such as Julian West were releasing LSD in the streets in Los Angeles, and you have Ram Dass and Timothy Leary at Harvard involved in the CIA element of this, popularizing psychedelic drugs. Uh, Aldous Huxley, who committed suicide on the day that Kennedy was assassinated while he was on a psychedelic drug, filming the whole thing. The only reason it didn't get coverage is because of the assassination. And you've got a lot of other strange things going on with people were being tampered with. Um, you had uh, experiments that were extremely ghoulish. I mean, it's a really interesting subject. And this is, and you're telling me that your brother and father were involved in MK Ultra. So let me, let's, before we get into what you were blowing the whistle about, talk a little bit about that. Well, my father was part of the, uh, I guess he was, he could have been chipped. He suffered from synthetic telepathy. And what they did was they threw him in psychiatric institutions get, and gave him electroshock therapy and brainwashed him. Now, my father owned a dry cleaning plant. Him and my mother, we had, had six children. I had five brothers. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he, I have passports of his where he was traveling, traveling over in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a gentleman called Dr. Richard Greer, who's into E.T., researches E.T. Okay. So, so I got a hold of Dr. Greer, and his personal assistant, assistant wrote to me. I gave her my father's documents. My father documented everything. He has audio tapes, photos, documents. Anyway, they said he was a covert courier. And what they would do is they'd hypnotize these guys, send them overseas, and they deliver messages to other spies. Now, if they got caught, they were hypnotized, so they could never be affiliated with anyone, really. Now, my father should have been traveling over in the Middle East, and I have his two passports in safety deposit boxes. He was in Hong Kong, Lisbon, uh, all over there. And uh, we were told that he had a mental break and he was suffering from a psychotic break, and he was chasing religious artifacts. That's what we were told as children. I was like five or six years old. Okay. But the truth be known, he was part of MK Ultra. Now, right. my brother was no, given ahead. LSD in the Air Force. He told me that before he died. He was murdered in Santa Barbara on Christmas Day of 1984. Mm -hmm. It was a okay. uh, phony suicide. It was, he was suicided. Yeah, they probably uh -huh. smothered him with a pillow. What uh -huh. happened was, my friend who was at my house partying that night is a mortician. He's a big, one of the biggest funeral directors here in Lancaster County. So I called him up to bring the body back, and when the body came back, he called me up right away. There were no literature marks on his neck, not one mark on his neck. So he couldn't have died by hanging, which is what the oh. investigation said. So he, uh, you know, like your father, maybe he had either served his purpose or he was about to blow the lid on, on the whole thing. And, well, uh, he was making rumpus. He was under a conservatorship, just like Britney Spears is out there. Yes. And they were holding half of his Social Security. He was only getting maybe 150 175 a month. But he was living on the streets of Santa Barbara or in transition houses most of the time. So he got a public defender, found out that they were t withholding half of his social security and he was calling us up family asking us for money and we were being told he was squandering his money oh. now he was thrown out of Lancaster County made to leave in 1976 why did they have it in for him I mean did, were they afraid that he was gonna blow the whistle on, on the program or, or what I don't know if you look if I I have his documentation I flew out I was certified by the NFL as a contract advisor the following March of 85, and I've been going into Santa Barbara County Courthouse and talking to the county people ever since, and uh, I, the documents I have from public defenders is he was raising some hell about the guardianship 
about the money they were holding. And he wanted to go to college again. He was going to Millersville University before he enlisted because of the draft. So he only lasted, no, I, he got a dishonorable I, discharge. I, I, years ago, I interviewed the late Jim Keith. I don't know if you know who he is. No, he not familiar. Black, Black Helicopters Over America and a couple of other really interesting books. Um, he actually um, died under mysterious circumstances, let's just put it that way, I mean, in a hospital, but he was not in poor health and the things that happened. And, uh, and he wrote extensively in, very, in a very well-documented way about MKUltra and um, the, the development of uh, mind-controlled people who would have, um, basically, they, they, they could be manipulated in such a way that they would carry out various things, including assassinations. He links it to the assassination of Robert Kennedy. I mean, that's a yeah. big subject. Well, and I that, filed an amicus for Sirhan Sirhan. Yeah, well, Sirhan Sirhan has said this uh, after on uh, many interviews that he had no idea what what he was doing at the time, and that uh, there were all these weird things going on before that with this woman in the red dress and there was all right. these polka dot dress. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there was all these weird, you know, this stuff. I mean, it's kind of such a such a creepy subject. I, well, you I, know, two years ago. Robert Kennedy Jr. came out and said half, yes. the, half the Kennedy family don't believe that he was the actual killer. Oh, yeah. Well, well, uh, JFK Jr. has been a real whistleblower and a real truth teller on, on all this stuff. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know... I, well, can I say one more thing, Charles, before yeah, I forget? Here's, here's the thing. My brother Sammy died Christmas Day of 1984 in Santa Barbara, California. My youngest brother died in Kill Devil Hills North Carolina in 1996 from a suspicious suicide, and my father was murdered up in New York City, where he was living for a year and a half, in 2001. So I've got three family members. I stay put. I don't leave Leicester County. Yeah, all of these suspicious suicides, it makes, gives you the creeps. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's safe to say, Stan, that while you're sitting here talking to me right now, that you're of sound mind and body, you're not suicidal, and uh, God forbid something happens, it's not suicide. No, they they use they go for the mental health right away. They went that they went after that for me in 1987. I was producing the first digital movie with Tony Bon Jovi and Power Station Studios in New York in 1987. Oh, okay. Now Tony's one of the leading recording studios in the world back then, and yeah. me and Tony were working on the movie. We had transcripts. We had we had everything gone. We had uh, a film producer from Hollywood, California. Well, I have documentation of that. And I had an airplane at the time. I was so busy. I had a uh, twin turboprop, a Navajo chieftain. Well, they repossessed my plane with all my files in it because I had an office in Stone Harbor. And, uh, I mean, it just gets deep state and deep state as far as what they did. So what they did was they, they said that I was making things up about the movie, 302 would me, threw me in psych wards. It never lasts. I'd get out in six hours or a couple days or whatever. But still, it went on the record. And that's still with right. me today. They still use it today. Well, I've been, you know, I've been institutionalized probably eight times for no reason, just because they can. Because, that, because now you can't get a firearm. You can't uh, do certain functions. You know, no. this is the tool of the deep state. I mean, it always has been. I'm not against psychology and psychotherapy. That's fine. But there is a, is an aspect to it, especially when you get into the medical side with the psychiatry, where it is basically the science of mind control. Well, they help build and the programs, psychiatrists. I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't need to talk over And you. they study on a mass level how to manipulate right. the masses. I mean, and, and I think that... Um, they use it as a tool against the enemies. You say the deep state. Well, I mean, didn't they spend a whole four years trying to have President Trump removed from office under the guise that oh, yeah, I know. Of Article 24 of the Constitution, which was that he did not, he was not mentally fit? You know, this is what they do to people who will disagree with the deep state. They basically say, don't listen to this person. They're mentally ill. They're not competent. And, you know, that, that's expected. You know, even now they're starting up. I mean, you have this congresswoman. She wants to establish a truth commission in the Congress so that they can start to develop a single narrative for the whole country 
and basically anybody who doesn't agree is going to be deemed as mentally ill. Yeah. They have a gun control bill before Congress right now, which says that you have to pass a mental test in order to purchase a gun. Guess what that means? In other words, if you're a Trump supporter, you don't get to get a gun. That's what that means. Well, you know, I have a pending amicus in the Nicholas Cruz case, and the judge won't rule right now before okay. Judge Shear. Now, Nicholas Cruz, I go through information and research when I suspect there might be someone that is targeted. And uh, Nicholas Cruz is one. Uh, Stephen Santiago, the Fort Lauderdale shooter, is another one. Aaron Alexis. All these guys have the same traits. They were all military trained. They were all passed through the system. And Nicholas Cruz, if you look at his first interview, they have it out on YouTube. I have it on my, linked on a lot of my sites. If you look at that first interview where he discusses the voices, that is synthetic telepathy. There's no doubt about, to me. So he was hearing voices in his oh, head. Oh, yeah. The the voices himself. told him to kill. And, you know, the same thing was, as I said, we talked about Sirhan Sirhan. I mean, the same, you, you know, when you have situations like this where there is somebody committing a mass murder for no reason that's, that's obvious, and it's... Uh, you know, it's something that obviously has an element of premeditation. You would think that our our government, but certainly our establishment, would look upon it as as they would look upon any crime. They would do some investigation and some research. I mean, well, when, a, when an airplane crashes, the FAA looks at the crash. They try to figure out what went wrong. Was it human error? Was it design error? Was it you know stress? What happened? And then they they write a report. And they try to make improvements as a result. And the same thing should apply to all of these school shooters, all well, of these he, mass he, murderers, the guy over in uh, you know in Las Vegas. Oh yeah. And, and I think that there are certain patterns, as you say, that emerge. And one of them is, and again, I'm not here to say don't do this, but I think it's safe to say that all of them were on some kind of a psychotropic drug. And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for that. If it's properly prescribed and if someone is under medical observation, I'm not suggesting that. I'm not here to plan that. I'm not a, I'm not a pharmacist. But the fact is that you have to look at the, you know, the fine print in those things. I mean, the, the, you know, it says, well, in, in tiny print, it may, be, may result in suicide or homicide. <laughs> well, here's the problem. Here's the problem, Charles, yeah. is that they're using satellites now for these technologies, these weapons. So you can't trace the source, really, because Iraq has systems, China has systems, Russia, Russia was bombarding our embassy in the 50s with microwaves. See, they're using microwaves. Oh, yeah. Didn't that happen also recently, right after... Yeah, China, China, China and our embassy in Cuba. And the, Yeah, that's right. The embassy in Cuba was, was bombarded with microwaves, and people at the embassy were getting sick, and they were getting headaches, and they were getting migraines, and... And it was proven. I think the same thing happened with the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Yeah, I mean, the weapons are brutal. Now, they, they can, you know, they can implant dreams. They can implant voices. Uh, they can implant pain anywhere they want. They can stop your heart at the drop of a hat if they wanted to. They're lethal weapons. But yeah. now they're included. What happened was the church hearings settled down the CIA. So what they did was they took all those programs and shifted them over to DOD, DARPA, Navy Intelligence, and things like that. That's essentially what happened. Okay. They skirted them out of... No, they didn't miss a beat. They just no, they didn't miss a beat. No, yeah, exactly right. Exactly you know, right. I, uh, Michael Glennon is a professor at the Lecture School of Law and Diplomacy. He's a big insider establishment you know, guy. He was a Senate counsel during the Obama administration. Now... He wrote a book called The Double Government, where he talks about this. I interviewed him. He didn't agree with my conclusions, but he understood them and he respected them. He didn't mean to say half the things he does say in this book. But he talks about how, starting in 1948, when President Harry Truman signed the National Security Act as an executive order, it created this massive deep state. I mean, you had yeah. the National Security Council, the DSA, the CIA, now you have added on to that all these other agencies with something like 50 agencies. 
including the uh, new Homeland Security Department, and that they all operate with sovereign powers. They're not under the direct control. They get some government funding, but they all have black accounts. Black budgets, yeah. That's right. Just like what you're, you're doing, Stan. I mean, they have private companies. They're interacted. They're intersected with international intelligence organizations like the MI5 and the Mossad and, you know, all these other groups. And, and they're not particularly loyal to the United States. It's more this kind of international, you know, kind of nebulous, informal global order. I'm sorry to have to say that. Now they call it the reset. Yeah, that's why I keep saying we need a renewed church hearings in, in Congress. But the problem and is... That's why they it, despise Donald Trump. Well, the there's a conflict of interest because a lot of those people know, know that these programs go on. But you know what I mean? They're going up against yeah. their own. It, it's a tough. Oh, that, it's all that's why, that's why. That's why Julian Assange is tortured the way he's tortured. That's why that Edward is, Snowden. Yeah. They yeah, won't let him back. They're in. all whistleblowers. Exactly. And according to uh, Michael uh, Michael Glennon in his book Double Government, they have their people in all branches of government, in all of the major private sector, top one percent corporations. He says he names several several Supreme Court justices that are involved, people on the Federal Reserve Board, people in Congress, people in all aspects of our government are a part of this thing. I mean, this well, sort of the FISA court, the FISA, the FISA court is one of the mechanisms they use uh, to yeah. go the whistleblowers. You know, th you know that court. Uh, well, it, well, that that's why they went after. Um, you know, well, they didn't, but I mean, I think that certainly the same group of people went after Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. Sure. Because he talked about whistleblowers. I mean, he was all over this. They well, the, him. The, in 2005, the DIA picked me up. Now, he was the former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Yeah. In 2005, I was down in Austin visiting my brother, who was a physician. He had a family practice, and I was on a military museum, on a military base. It was a museum. The DIA came in, these two guys in suits, hauled me outside, went through my van, interrogated me, wouldn't let me leave for a couple hours. Had to verify where I was staying. Then in 2016, the NSA had me down in Fort Meade for two hours, did the same thing to me. I mean, they don't let me alone. I'm getting the heebie jeebies just talking about this. I mean, I've got bull holes in my windows. Yeah, it's, it's ugly. You yeah. Know, it's, um, Whistleblower, like I say, Edward Snowden has it made compared to me. Yeah, I'm stuck uh, here, yeah. sitting duck. I mean, he's got well, you know, he's just had a child, and he's under the protection of Putin. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not good either. But they, they, and two years ago, they filed stalking charges against me. My neighbors would stalk me. It's a big gang stalking program. That's one of the you know weapons they use against you. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. You have a lot of I, you, the documents you sent me. You go on about this as a tactic. What is this gang stalking? Well, it's when people harass you everywhere you go. Complete strangers. And neighbors and friends. And, and well, how does that, what does that mean? What well, they doing? follow you. They uh, jump in front of you in line. They make gestures at your cars all the time. They, make, they let you know that you're being surveilled, illegally surveilled and watched. In fact, Julia McKinney, uh, one of the whistleblowers, uh, she was Army Intelligence, and in 1990, she formed a group of former uh, intelligence officers that wanted to come clean, and uh, she says there's a national broadcast system that's being used on closed-circuit TVs uh, where they use for the stalking purposes, where they use it for entertainment or to show people what targets, who the targets are, and it's broadcast all over the country. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's very much complicated. It's a point. complicated communication system, is what it is. Right, and and they constantly harass you. Harass you. I mean, uh, I, you know, I had a situation, frankly, in my own life where this happened for a brief period of time when I was running for Congress against Barney Frank. I'm not going to talk about it because it's over. I mean, the election was over and it stopped, and uh, I'm going to leave it there. But uh, you know, I I know what you're talking about. Yeah, they interrupt everything. They hack. Every electronic device I have is hacked. I have to wipe my computers every couple of weeks. Um, every electronic account I have is hacked. 
I mean, this, uh, you know, I'm waiting for Walmart and, and to deliver. Basically, the, uh, the, this is, in a sense, I think that this whole thing really accelerated under Obama because Obama was kind of a, a control freak. He liked it, to know what everybody was doing. That administration was, was tough on whistleblowers. Oh, yeah. He loved to eavesdrop. And yeah. uh, even, even Angela Merkel complained. She brought her yeah. complaint up to the U.N. He spied on friends and enemies. He just wanted to know what everybody was doing. It was kind of like this intense desire to control. He, that was an obsession of his, I think. And he used his office to do that. He was harassing organizations that were not of his political stripe by having the IRS harass them, you know, from the lowest learner testimony and, and other kind of dirty tricks. And I think that the result of that is that we have a much more enhanced technological tyranny today. We have the ability technologically of the government, and I don't mean formally, but more like kind of this informal collusion between various oligarchs in the government and monopolistic private entities like big tech and you know big big drug farmer or whoever that that are able to monitor people. Well, see, that's the standard. problem. The Amazon, the Googles of the world, they all have so much private information on everyone that, I mean, that's where the surveillance comes from. Right. I mean, Amazon's a big defense contractor, and very few people know that. Huge defense contractor. Oh, yeah. I mean, that most of their money comes from renting out their cloud to the right. defense department. Right. Same that's thing with Google. That's why they were able to take down Parler, because right. uh, it was competing with Twitter, and it was gaining on them very quickly, and, and they unfortunately were renting cloud space from uh, Google, and from, uh, I think they had some interface with Amazon, so all they had to do was pull the plug on them. Yeah. You know, now the lesson there is that Parler should have done what Gab has done, what Alex Jones did, and it's expensive, and it takes time, but you have to set up your own cloud system. You have to set up your own servers, your own, you know, infrastructure. And that way you have a certain amount of autonomy. And, you know, it does look to me like that's the way things are moving. People yeah. are beginning to almost establish an alternative means. I mean, there's like a, an alternative economy, an alternative culture that is, is, is developing because you know, ultimately, we are still a free country, and people still, freedom is the natural state of being, and people are going to find a way. So, you know, they, they, they may take Parler down, but they can't, you know, Parler's coming back now, I think, with its own, they, they learned their lesson. I mean, it unfortunately happened at a very difficult time. We don't want to talk about the election, because I'll get banned. But let's just say that um, their shutdown was, was timed interestingly, leave it at that. Well, they, you know, they make a concerted effort to dumb down society. Yep. When, when they quiet whistleblowers down and people that talk against the government, they're dumbing down society is what they're doing, keeping people dumb. And one of the ways they do that is just the word conspiracy theory. All they have to, use, all they have to do is associate your name with the word conspiracy theory, and it's that cancel c culture right. uh, segment, uh, you know, of how they do it. You know, it's interesting that, ironically, it was the deep state itself that pushed the biggest conspiracy theory of the, of my lifetime, and which was that Donald Trump was spying for Russia. Right? Yeah, I know, I know. I mean, and they spent millions of dollars, and every day I, I would get these bulletins from the Boston Globe, you know, oh, breaking story, you know, you have a nervous breakdown looking at my smartphone. Oh, what is it? What is it? You know, Stormy Daniels said this. You know, it's like, in other words, you know, it was this constant barrage of information to try to prove that Trump was colluding, is the word. Well, used. Russia's an easy target. You know, people like to use well, Russia. I mean, the, the, it, it's still Russia phobia, even, it, you know, oh, yeah, dating it's back it's to okay. McCarthyism. It's I the mean, it hasn't changed. It's McCarthyism, except right. McCarthy was right. Yeah. But putting that aside, I mean, there is a letter. I mean, I heard Rudolph Giuliani talk about this, that, he has he has possession of a letter that was sent from uh, from Brennan, who was the head of the CIA at the time, formerly a, a, a supporter of uh, Gus Hall, the Communist Party, who voted for him, and he actually sent a letter to Hillary Clinton saying that 
to get the attention off of the uh, the email scandal where she was basically using her office to travel around the world and shake down world leaders for money. Yeah, I know. To the, uh, you know, the, uh, the slush fund, the uh, Clinton Foundation. The release of that bad information would be put aside and the diversion would be that we're now going to make these claims that Donald Trump is fine for Russia. That's in writing. I mean, that's apparently a letter that Brennan sent to, um, I, I think, probably Hillary. I don't know. But I mean, is that, that's something that's now public record. I think that uh, Judicial Watch got that released through Freedom of Information Act. But uh, getting back to the subject, we don't want to get too diverted into politics here. Stan, so you started out as a whistleblower. And exactly what was it that you were blowing the whistle on? Well, International Freedom Control had a company that was an 8A set-aside company. It was a minority-owned firm. And Jim Guerin came from Lockheed Martin in the early 70s. He first worked for Hamilton Watch, which is right here eight blocks from me, and they built uh, fuses, military fuses for bombs. Well, then he built ISC. Well, ISC came to me through ChemCon, I thought, and wanted me to finance some of their operations. And I had their financial statements and things like that. And I got suspicious of the conversation. And I said, you know, I said, there's some fraud in some of these contracts. And right after the gentleman left, I locked my office up, changed my locks on my office, and fled down to my satellite office in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, where we were going to shoot the movie. And that's when people came after me and started the stalking, the harassment, the fabricated uh, false arrests, and things like that. So what I did was I called some public officials up about what was going on. And leading up to that, there was a coup inside my company to steal my share of the company. And anyway, I ended up blowing the whistle on the fraud inside the contract. But what I found out a few years later is that the gentleman who came to see me was one of the three people, principals, for international signal and control that was sued for the billion dollar fraud by Ferrani. So, but he didn't disclose that. So that's essentially what I blew the whistle on. Right, and um, I think that it's safe to say that in the present atmosphere, unless you were blowing in the whistle on uh, Donald Trump with his phone call to the Ukrainian president, in which case you can do it through third-hand information, you know, which is not admissible in a courtroom, and you could have your identity protected. Well, I tried to do all that in 05. It did work. Yeah, but, but the point is that if you're a real whistleblower and you actually are a witness to crime, you know, it's a very scary time. Well, very few whistleblowers get any type of protection. They get the opposite. Yeah. But you're supposed to. I mean, oh, I know. The law, that's, yeah. Retaliation. That's the I mean. Whistleblower Act, which yeah. protects whistleblowers. In fact, I think the first act was 1986, a yeah, year before I, mean, I really blew the whistle. It's supposed to protect whistleblowers right. because we want to have someone who's a first-hand witness to crime to expose it. Otherwise, we're going to have a, you know, that's a natural protection and safeguard against corruption. Right. It's just that simple. I mean, that's, we need whistleblowers. That's the job of, you know, honest, conscientious people with a conscience. In a true democracy, right, you want to open debate in a true democracy. You can't be silencing people in a true democracy. I guess exactly. that's, that's a hypo hypocrisy. We look at countries like Iran and China and North Korea that, that have these closed societies where they really have no openness, no transparency, and we're just as bad. In my mind, I mean, you know, from my I, experience, I we are. You know, I think that we we are, are becoming. I mean, I I, I hope that um, you know I, I continue on this forum, and every day when I turn on my YouTube channel, I wonder if it's still going to be there, and I don't know. But you know, as long as it is, I intend to do this program and continue daily to uh, try to do what you're doing, Stan, which is blow the whistle on the, on corruption. Well, today, you're, you know. There's so much technology out there. Elon Musk has a company called Neuralink. And you know what Neuralink does? What do they do? He reverse engineered the CIA's chip for MKUltra. Oh, my. 
Elon Musk. Yeah, that's incredible. Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook. He had a company, a division called Building 8, and I applied for a position there mm -hmm. that was trying to use synthetic telepathy for Facebook. In other words, you would use your mind to message people. Now, technology is possible. There's patents out there. I mean, they're mainstreaming these technologies. They're commercializing and mainstreaming all these technologies so that it gives a cover for the government programs that started the technologies. You know what I mean? Right, well, I mean, the government actually started all of the technologies of the Internet. Sure. DARPA, DARPA started the Internet. Yeah. In fact, did. in 1990, I helped pioneer the CD-ROM industry and did work with DARPA. Now, I didn't know who DARPA was back then. We sure. built, we helped build voice recognition systems. I did the CD-ROM manufacturing for the uh, speech kapoor that went out to all the scientists. I was exclusive. You know, it's brilliant science. It's extraordinary. Look, I'm doing this program. Just I'm some schlub sitting in a in a in a room in an apartment here, and I'm able to do live stream this program with you. And you're I don't know where you are. You're in Pennsylvania. I'm in Boston. Lancaster, Amish okay. country. There you go. And I'm in Boston, and we're able to be heard live on I think it's about a dozen streams and then yeah. the archives and I go it goes into iHeartRadio and all these other venues it's fantastic so I admire the technology the problem is how do you kind of develop a certain level of proprietorship I mean it gets into wow. the very basic principle that freedom is founded on and that America we think is founded on which is private ownership private property. Here's one of the problems. Yeah. Computer hackers. There are these young kids that are 16, 18 years old. I bet you they can hack into some government agencies. I mean, that's the problem. Everything computerized is hackable. Well, it is, but there is still growing technology that can prevent that. And I'll, I'll give the example. Uh, the state of Israel, in the last war they had with Hamas, there was over a million attempts to hack into their computer systems, all of which failed because they have built such an ironclad system of protection that they were able to fend that off. They're very good at that. You know, they're very advanced in the area of like, uh, you know, computer science and, and, and data science and all sure. the science. Oh, yeah. So I only mention that because it can be done. Uh, we can, in other words, there has to be a means by which we can own what we're doing online. Now, I know that we don't own Facebook. I get that. It's a private company, and they can do whatever they want. I know they're using data to sell commercials, and that's how they make their money. That's their business model. You know, if you look at it, like when I order a book from Amazon, all of a sudden I'm getting ads for books that are similar to that book. I get that. That's how ad agencies used to work before the Internet. They gather... They do survey and they gather information. That's fine. But at the same time, there has to be a means by which we can maintain a certain level of ownership over our intellectual property, you well, know, even if we are borrowing space from them. Charles, I haven't owned my own mind since, since 2005. I mean, these satellites literally steal your mind. How does that work? What do you mean, how does it work? I mean, you see the, the NSA has the, the NS, Edward Stone disclosed the NSA program where they can use satellites to read every thought in your mind in your head. Now, is this to do with this uh, 3D thing that I'm hearing about? No. This technology. This, uh, this has to be, This has to do with remote neural monitoring. Okay. That's how they do it. Do you, do you know what, what they can do is they can read your mind? They can't necessarily, can they implant things? Sure. You, you know what? They have, I have lectures by people in DARPA mm -hmm. that disclose how they can download a training, a, 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 a training session that might, might be, might take you two months and they can download it in your mind in a matter of seconds. How can we stop it? I don't know. I don't know I mean, that you can. Some, I mean, this sounds. I know this sounds kind of hokey. Oh, I know, but it's real. I know it does. No, I'm not this. I'm saying, but I've seen ads for these um, these hats. 
Right, that's what the, that's what they're using. Well, Brain to computer interface. It's supposed to block your, it protect your your mind. Your oh head. no no no, they don't work. That's, no. that's got Faraday it. hats, Faraday cages. Think no, they don't. They, 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 they don't. They work. don't no, you can't mess no, with that. You can't. I, so like, like, short short of some kind of hokey means to protect ourselves and to protect our brains and our minds, what can we do? How can we know? Church this is hearings is the only way. The what? Church hearings is the only way to start to address the, the problem. Yeah, but that's not going to happen now. Well, well that, yeah, they're incomplete. The Congress has been. I mean, it, it's unless the next election we can we can get back the Congress. I don't know, but do you understand you know, what telepathy is? Please describe it. I mean, I kind telepathy. Of it, but, telepathy yeah. is like there's a mobile phone implanted in your brain that won't turn off. I have been talking to someone for 15 years, 24-7, never stopped. We used to talk to each other in our sleep. They used to conference call me with two or three other people at the same time. Brain-to-computer interface, brain-to-brain -brain interface. It's the uh, voice is... something that's not voluntary on your part? Of course not. There's, no. Well, well, describe it, please. I just did. How does that actually happen? I mean, what, what do they come to you like, um, you know... I, I Microwaves. Heard, Okay. What is the it's experience low, like? All of a sudden something flashes into your, your mind? I mean, No, they, they started with it, me. They did it. They built it over about nine months. The well, I mean, I just think it's valuable right now in this short time we have today. And, we'll, and I'll have you back because I want to further develop this. For you to describe what this actually is so that we, if, we can know if this is ever happening to us and then at least identify it as a first step all right step. i'll give the best way i can describe it is if you close your eyes and i'll ask you to count to 10. yeah that's what it's like only instead of that your your mind saying one two three it's someone else's voice clear as day that's what it's like Okay, I mean, I I've been trying to think about if this is ever if I've had any experiences like this. I know that I've well, they could be reading your mind subliminally, and you wouldn't know it. They well, could, I know that I've had some very intense, very vivid dreams. Well, they do a lot of dream manipulation, and I have like arguments with Henry Kissinger or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I just yeah, you could be. Like, you're. I mean, <laughs> I don't know anything else about you, but it's worth researching. Yeah. So listen no, to I, some of the lectures of some of the experts. You'll pick up a few things that you may find symptomatic of being a target. As far as the mind, you know, technologies, the weapons. They use extremely low frequency, uh, extremely low frequencies. If you remember Aaron Alexis, the Navy Yard shootings. Yes. Remember that? I was a member of Freedom from Covert Harassment Surveillance. Derek Robinson was an NSA whistleblower. And it was a human rights group. We were trying to get help in stopping these technologies. Well, Aaron sent Derek a suicide letter right before the killing center at the Navy Yard. Now, Aaron was suffered from synthetic telepathy, and he thought the source of the weapons was the Navy Yard. But on his right, on his shotgun or rifle, he etched in ELF, extremely low frequencies, and that's what they use as far as the, the technology, the microwaves use those frequencies to put voices in your head. They can cause, they cause pain all over my body at will. I mean, they do all sorts of things. Oh, my God. Well, listen, Stan, um, I hope that you're going to weave this into a book. And, and oh, they won't let me do anything. This, you know what they did? They charged me with stalking my neighbors when they charged me, and they put me on probation for 15 years. Oh, my God. Well, yeah. you know, listen, Stan, let's stay in touch. Yes. Uh, this interview will be up on YouTube, at, you know, live. I mean, it, it archives there immediately. And as I've told you, it goes on at least a dozen other sites. It's on, on Rumble and on Mines and on, uh, you know, all of the audio sites that I have. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, we can begin to shine a light on some of this stuff. And I hope that you come back from time to time and we can continue the conversation. Yes, definitely. Just let me know, Charles. I appreciate it. Now, Stan, is there any particular website you'd like to give out or information about yourself that you want people to know? They shut down my websites. I have a Twitter page up, 
where I post things. And I have, uh, I have a document that has like 98 videos, uh, I think 20 audio recordings from 87 on that more or less is all the evidence I used uh, and for my case. Yes, Where's people can access. I, it's up on, I, I, I have it up on a Google Cloud, but you can access it on the top page of my Twitter account. It's under yeah, Advanced Media you Group. Sent it, you sent it to me through yes. LinkedIn, so people want to kind of subscribe to you on LinkedIn, and, uh, yes. and you'll send it to them if they ask for it. Yes. All right, Stan Taterbone, I want to thank you for joining me today. Great pleasure. All right, Great Charles. Night. Be well, be careful. God bless. You too. Thank you. Take care of yourself. All right. Bye. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. This is an extremely important issue that is of great importance far beyond the person of Julian Assange. I think this case has, uh, although obviously every uh, case like this has a personal aspect, and I'm sure that uh, it also uh, Stella Morris afterwards will speak to that as well. But uh, I think we all have to be, uh, to try to focus on the overall importance of this case. Myself, I was contacted by uh, Julian Assange's lawyers in December 2018. He was still at the Ecuadorian embassy and they asked me to intervene on his behalf and said that his uh, living conditions at the embassy amounted to cruel and human and degrading treatment. And I had this visceral reaction of, uh, I'm not going to be manipulated by this narcissist and rapist and hacker and so on. And, <laughs> To my shame, I, I didn't know anything about this case, but somehow I emotionally felt I knew everything about Julian Assange. And I'm telling you this because it led me to not get engaged in the case for three months until his lawyers came back and said, we have rumors that his expulsion from the embassy is imminent. Could you please look into the case? And they sent me some some medical expertise and opinions of independent medical experts that had visited him and some other materials. And only once I started to look in the, those pieces of evidence, I realized that there really wasn't um, any facts to back up this narrative that I had had in my own mind. So I'm telling you all of this because I think that's the most important obstacle to having a clear 2020 vision even before 2021 this year, uh, on, this, on this case, is that we're always looking at Julian Assange. And because most of us don't know him personally, we're looking at a persona that has been created uh, of him or for him or in his place, uh, mainly uh, in, in various media uh, platforms and so on over the last 10 years. And I can assure you, I've investigated this case for two years. There is nothing to back up um, this this narrative. Um, so, I, I obviously I could speak here in very much detail to all aspects of the investigation, but I propose that I will then answer two questions if if people want to know more specifically about specific aspects. But uh, I'd like to focus on the state side of this because we're talking about a prosecution, and when someone is being prosecuted, we always look at the person. We're not looking at the prosecuting side. And I'm arguing that what's being done here is a prosecution that is not pursuing law and justice, but is pursuing political purposes. And therefore it is a persecution, it is not a prosecution. And the, all of this hinges on the good faith of the prosecuting states. And here I'm talking not only about the, the, the US, I'm also speaking of the UK, I'm speaking of Sweden, I'm speaking of Ecuador. Um, and in all of those four cases, uh, states in every single proceeding that had been led against uh, Julian Assange or involving him, his procedural rights, I can assert that as an international lawyer, have been systematically violated in each stage of each proceeding in each jurisdiction. And we're talking about a person, as we know, who's exposed evidence for war crimes. None of these crimes has ever been prosecuted. Already that disproves the good faith of those authorities, because clearly those war crimes are much more serious than what Julian Assange could ever conceivably have been committed. None of this is being prosecuted, but he is being persecuted. He's not even a whistleblower who's had a duty of, of allegiance or of secrecy. He's a publicist, a journalist who has published evidence for serious crimes. Now, we can see, as I said, in the Swedish proceedings, 
clear violations of his procedural rights. I can speak to that in detail if you'd like. Ecuador has expelled him from the embassy without any due process, has taken his, state, his statehood away, his, uh, not his statehood, his citizenship away uh, without any due process. In the UK proceeding, unfortunately, to my shock, and I'm a professor at the British University myself, oh, shit, not, not Iraqi, I'm a grand, not Iraqi. I could see how his um, um, rights have been systematically violated. In the US, uh, Julian Assange would not expect a fair trial either. Um, the good faith of those states is also disproven by the, the way in which they engage with my mandate. I'm mandated by states to report to states about their compliance with their obligations under the Convention Against Torture. And by, when I reported to those four states that I had identified serious violations of human rights law in this case, and that I asked for an investigation, and for them to cooperate with my investigation, they refused to engage in a constructive dialogue altogether. And even my follow-up letters, my reports to the General Assembly in New York, my reports to the Human Rights Council in Geneva, nothing was able to uh, achieve a, uh, a, a conduct by these states that would have uh, be compliant with their human rights obligations. I'm not saying that they needed necessarily to agree with my findings that Julian Assange had been exposed to psychological torture, but by treaty law, they're obliged to conduct a prompt and impartial investigation under the Convention Against Torture as soon as they have reasonable uh, 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 evidence to, to believe that the act of torture could have been committed. And for that, it is sufficient that my mandate makes those, transmits those allegations. I didn't take those allegations somewhere from the press uh, uh, or obscure sources. I actually wanted to avoid any kind of politicization and went to visit Julian Assange in prison in May 2019, just after his arrest, together with two very experienced uh, experts, medical experts, uh, specialized in examining victims of torture. And they have worked in this for about 30 years. They have uh, examined victims in the Balkan Wars and the Middle East. I mean, they, they have no reason to seek publicity. You will have noticed in the last two years, they have never appeared in the press. Um, so they're not you know, scandal seeking kind of uh, people. They're very experienced uh, independent medical experts. Both of them uh, and myself, we all came to the conclusion that Julian Assange showed the symptoms that are typical for uh, victims of psychological torture. And here we're talking about ill treatment that is uh, uh, comparable to a type of mobbing uh, that we would know from our private lives or, you know, that everyone would be familiar with. Uh, it's a very common method of psychological torture because it doesn't leave physical traces, but is extremely destructive to the human mind and emotional stability in the long term. And it, it, it has several components. It, it always includes a form of isolation, social isolation or physical isolation. In Julian Assange's case, we progressively have both of those uh, aspects. Then there is a threat scenario that is there that something bad could happen at any moment. And, and here we have the extradition to the US. And I mean, all human rights organizations agree that the conditions of detention for uh, political detainees or uh, let's say national security detainees in the US uh, amount to inhumane and, and cruel treatment. And, and so we have the isolation of the threat scenario. We have the, 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 the constant arbitrariness of official behavior and here we're talking to his constant violations of his procedural rights. He doesn't get access to his lawyers. He doesn't get access to his very basic rights as a defendant just to prepare his, his defense. He doesn't get access to his legal files. Um, and, 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 and so on top of this, we have this campaign of defamation where he is constantly being humiliate, humiliated and ridiculed, but he can't answer to those accusations in a way that protects his human rights. All of these elements you will find in a mobbing context. And we know that mobbing can lead people to commit suicide. It's a very serious form of abuse, although it doesn't leave immediate physical traces. So all of this I reported to those states uh, and, and it has been confirmed by other independent medical doctors. We've had hundreds of doctors intervening internationally uh, uh, with the British government. We've had the uh, European Parliament uh, uh, passing resolutions. We've had the International Bar Association uh, protesting officially against 
the, uh, the, the unfair trial that Julian Assange is getting. We've had inter Amnesty International speaking out against his extradition. Even New York Times, The Guardian, uh, who have been critical to some aspects of WikiLeaks work in, in the past, have very clearly spoken out against uh, the uh, unjust treatment of, of Julian Assange. The Working Group on Arbitrary attention, uh, Detention of the United Nations years ago has decided that his uh, confinement in the embassy is arbitrary. Uh, I have investigated this case. I have no personal stakes in this case. And I was even biased, I admit it to my shame, biased against Julian Assange in the beginning. But when once I looked at the fact, it was clear that this is not a prosecution, it is a persecution. Now, let us not, and I will close on this last aspect, um, let us not be misled by the seemingly positive uh, uh, result of the uh, the judgment of 4th of January, which refuses extradition um, uh, based on medical grounds. Uh, it's, a, it's a slightly or even strongly misleading judgment because first, the judgment goes all the way to confirm the US uh, indictment for espionage, which basically sets a precedent case that uh, what Julian Assange has done, which is investigative journalism is a crime under the Espionage Act, and not only that, but also under the British Official Secrets Act. So it also really concerns every single British citizen. Uh, they could be criminalized for exposing uh, uh, dirty secrets, if you allow me that term, uh, of, of the government. Um, and, and so they confirmed that narrative. They, they, contrary to the will of British Parliament, they, the, the judge said that the, uh, the exception for political offenses, as, so the prohibition of extraditions for political offenses did not apply, although it is expressly in the treaty between the UK and the US. Um, and, and, and so they confirmed this whole precedent case and in the end didn't extradite him, not yet at least, for medical reasons, because the, uh, the prison conditions in the US would be oppressive to uh, uh, in, in view of the mental health of Julian Assange. Now that's a, a, a little bit of a trap because in the appeals case now, obviously the only question the US will appeal is that precise question on whether their the conditions of detention are inhumane and whether they're uh, uh, acceptable uh, to, uh, to, to Julian Assange. And so now here they can make diplomatic assurances with regard to those conditions and thereby remove that obstacle fairly easily. And the whole appeals proceeding has now been reduced to that discussion. We're no longer discussing political offense. We're no longer discussing press freedom. We're no longer discussing war crimes. We're only discussing uh, those uh, assurances and they can easily be given by the US. And afterwards, as we know, those assurances are not always uh, respected in practice. So I think it's more of a maneuver to reduce and focus the appeals proceeding to something that's beneficial to the US, then that this is really about a, uh, an expression of, of consideration of humanity uh, on behalf of, of Julian Assange. And I can even prove that with a, 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 a final point. Um, if the judge considers that solitary confinement in the US is inhumane and oppressive and would lead uh, Julian Assange to commit suicide, then why does she send Julian Assange back to solitary confinement in the UK? where there is no need and no, uh, no uh, legal basis to keep him in solitary confinement. He's not serving a sentence. He is only being kept uh, there in confinement to uh, assure his presence in case he should be extradited. So it's a preventative detention so he doesn't escape. But you don't need solitary confinement in Belmarsh for that. Uh, where lawyers don't have access, family doesn't have access, where he can't exercise his profession, he should be now in a, a house arrest context, such as has been given to Augusto Pinochet when he was in extradition detention. Uh, uh, he was held in a villa in house arrest and had all other liberties uh, save for he wouldn't leave the UK. And that's the only uh, legitimate purpose for restricting Julian Assange's uh, uh, purpose if ever we should consider that extradition proceeding legitimate in the first place. But if we do that, then he could at the most be lawfully kept in house arrest. So the fact that he's being kept in an expensive solitary confinement uh, arrangement in uh, Belmarsh uh, uh, it proves that the authorities have other things in mind than just assure his presence for that trial.
We've seen a lot of different faces of Julian Assange in the last uh, six months, but the uh, the suit and the the short haircut is new. Is this uh, is this a new image, or is it courtroom courtroom Assange? Well, it's um, when you're in this business, people will try and take any point they can uh, to malign um, to malign you and stop um, stop the power of uh, your publication, and so that's. Um, I guess the same reasons why politicians dress so conservatively uh, when they're under constant attack. And so that's um, something that, that uh, I have to do um, in order to um, keep the focus on our material and keep the focus off me. Well, it's uh, been an uphill battle keeping the focus uh, off you. Has it surprised you, the, the intensity of attention upon you? I don't think it's actually. I don't think it surprised me. Um, if you look at all, if if you think about the situation carefully, I suppose that's inevitable. Um, that someone who's uh, associated with a new endeavour that, that is very controversial and has a lot of very powerful enemies uh, will be the subject of ad hominem uh, attacks on the person uh, if they can't get an attack uh, on the content. That's um, that's standard fare, uh, of course. It's a new situation for me personally. I'm used to some. You've been a, pretty much a secretive, or certainly a, a private uh, I've been guy, or your life. Not, in, not entirely, um, but uh, I, I have been part of other causes in the past. But certainly, um, the level of uh, scrutiny and the level of um, attacks on my person is like nothing else um, I've experienced. Um, possibly. With, with some exceptions, like nothing else uh, anyone in Australia has experienced. Um, maybe Lindy Chamberlain has um, uh, probably had a, a similar level of um, uh, attacks against her person. A spokesperson for imprisoned Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny says he is near death. He's being blocked from seeing outside doctors. What are you doing to a free Navalny or at least get him medical attention? And what price will Vladimir Putin pay if Navalny dies in prison? Well, first, we joined with the European Union and many other like-minded democracies around the world to impose sanctions for what the Russian government has done to Navalny, for the use of a chemical weapon against him, which is in contravention of international law. Second, we have communicated to the Russian government that what happens to Mr. Navalny in their custody is their responsibility and they will be held accountable by the international community. In terms of the specific measures that we would, would undertake, we are right. looking at a variety of different costs that we would impose. And I'm not going to telegraph that publicly at this point, but we have communicated that there will be consequences if Mr. Navalny dies. So you've communicated that, but at the top there, President Biden, uh, apparently didn't mention Navalny in his call with Putin this week. He certainly didn't say anything about it publicly in his remarks on Thursday. And Russian state media is touting this as proof that Biden has given up on the issue. So why isn't President Biden demanding Navalny's release or at least, again, at least getting him a doctor at every single opportunity? We actually have made the judgment that direct communication to the Russian government on this issue including uh, both how we see it, how our allies and partners see it, and what might unfold should something uh, terrible happen to Mr. Navalny, should he, uh, well, terrible things, of course, have already happened to him, but should he pass away? And we have judged that rather than just make general statements publicly, the best way to deal with this issue is privately uh, and uh, through diplomatic channels direct to the uppermost levels of the Russian government. Well, let me ask one specific question. Uh, is the potential summit with Vladimir Putin on the table if, if Alexei Navalny passes away in prison? I'm not going to get into hypotheticals in large part, Dana, because there isn't currently a summit on the books. It's something we're talking about, and that summit would have to take place, of course, in the right circumstances, uh, in a way that could actually move the relationship forward. But I'm not going to get into hypotheticals about uh, when or whether the summit would likely occur.
Alexei Navalny's daughter Dasha has pleaded with Russian authorities to allow a doctor to treat her father, who is on hunger strike in prison after a group of medical professionals warned that he is in critical condition and at risk of kidney failure. The Stanford University student tweeted on Sunday, allow a doctor to see my dad. She joins a chorus of international public figures and Russian opposition regional lawmakers who are calling on Vladimir Putin to make sure the Kremlin critic is properly treated. <laughs> on Sunday, Navalny allies announced a street protest to be held on Wednesday, the same day Putin is to give an annual State of the Nation speech to the political elite. Navalny started refusing food in protest on March 31st, after accusing prison authorities of refusing to properly treat acute back and leg pain. Or treat acute back and leg pain. Authorities say Navalny was offered medical care, but refused it, insisting on being treated by a doctor of his choice from outside the facility. The request was denied. A medical trade union with ties to Navalny warned on Saturday that his kidneys could soon fail, which could lead to cardiac arrest. In a television interview with the BBC, Russia's ambassador to Britain accused Navalny of attention-seeking, adding, quote, he will not be allowed to die in prison. U.S. President Joe Biden's national security advisor Jake Sullivan told CNN on Sunday there will be consequences if he does. Our reality is that over a period of four years, the cooperation of states with my mandate has been marked by a staggering failure rate of 80% on country visit requests and of 90% on individual communications. This trend has remained largely unchanged since the establishment of the mandate in 1985. It goes without saying that consistent failure rates of 80 and 90% over a period of 35 years are not just reflective of a system facing certain challenges but exposes systemic failure, which fundamentally questions the credibility of states' commitment to the absolute and non-derogable prohibition of torture and ill-treatment. In order to reverse the long-standing and systemic shortcomings observed, nothing less than a groundbreaking change of attitude and serious efforts is required on the part of states. Governments must understand that the absolute and universal prohibition of torture and ill treatment is not some kind of declaratory slogan to be routinely repeated and celebrated at international conferences, but that it inevitably requires the political determination to take difficult decisions and the courage to face uncomfortable truths, not elsewhere, but right there at home. Last Sunday was the two-year anniversary of Julian's arrest and incarceration in Belmarsh. And there were protests and vigils on five continents, and the story was in the major UK newspapers. A double-decker bus was filled with people and draped with Julian Free Assange. And it followed the path from Julian's arrest at the Ecuadorian embassy to Belmarsh prison, where Julian has been buried from public view for the past two years. If it weren't for Julian's calls with me and a limited number of people, he would have no idea what was going on, not only around the world, but just 50 yards from the cell that holds him. This is what a prison like Belmarsh is for, to seal you off, to make you feel that you are alone and forgotten to the world. Julian spends most of the hours of the day alone. When we speak, it's only 10 minutes at a time. Imagine being forced to communicate with your loved one in this way. Imagine having to explain to our children, Max, who's two, and Gabriel, who's three, why daddy was speaking to them one second and then disappeared the next. Imagine telling them that their father wants to come home, but they won't let him yet. I don't know how to describe what I have had to witness. Terms such as monumental injustice, aberration come to mind. And I think of alluding to basic democratic principles and human rights, but all these are words that ultimately feel stale and abstract. 
I have not yet found the words for what we are going through. Julian is the most considerate, principled and generous person I know. And what is being done to him is cruelty in its rawest form. Julian has spent two years in a high security prison. The Obama administration decided not to charge Julian because Julian's conduct was no different to that of the rest of the press. Charging Julian would mean criminalizing journalism. Obama pardoned the alleged source, Chelsea Manning, who was free. The charges brought by Mike Pompeo and the Trump administration do just that. They criminalize journalism. To date, Julian has suffered severe punishment through process, surrounded by the worst murderers and drug dealers in Britain. He's in a prison where prisoners are killed through murder or suicide every few months. He faces 175 years or however many life sentences if you want to quantify. All this for publishing information of the highest political and historical interest. On the 4th of January, the lowest court in this country, the UK, blocked the extradition because the judge concluded that extraditing Julian to the brutal and inhumane treatment he would receive would inevitably kill him. The DOJ is appealing and the High Court will decide in the coming weeks if and when the appeal is heard. A reversal of the decision to block extradition would mean a death sentence for Julian. This case should be understood with the urgency and importance of a capital case. The US government says it has the prerogative to decide what foreign press can publish about its abuses committed abroad. It is extending its criminal laws to the rest of the world to prosecute a publisher who has won the highest awards for journalism for doing his job, an Australian living and working in London, Paris and Berlin for a Europe-based publishing organization a card-holding member of his press union whose allegiance is to the public. Let's pause and think about what the US case against Julian is actually saying. The US government is claiming that journalists all over the world have no freedom of expression rights and protections because they are not US citizens, that US criminal laws apply to them, but the First Amendment does not, even when they are in their own countries. If everything else was the same, if Julian was in London working for WikiLeaks, but he had an American passport, then he might have a defense. But because of the single fact that he does not have an American passport, he doesn't. If the case would have been brought by any other country, it would have been immediately thrown out and publicly ridiculed. The case against Julian is the ultimate realization of Trump's America first policy. It has added an aggressive new dimension to American exceptionalism that removes our rights as non-Americans in our own countries and infringes our sovereignty. Reporters Without Borders and the National Union of Journalists in the UK have said that as long as Julian is in prison and faces extradition, the UK is not a safe place for journalists and publishers to work. The Trump administration advanced this perversion and other countries will inevitably follow, leading to a global race to the bottom for freedom of expression. The effect of this extraterritorial discriminatory intrusion is to erode freedoms globally. So the far reaching consequences of this case cannot be overstated. At the same time, the case is an embarrassment to all the governments involved. It is obvious to everyone that the UK and the US cannot advance their human rights and press freedom foreign policy agendas effectively with Julian in prison. Across the world, the detention of Julian is causing real harm right now, not just to him, but to human rights defenders everywhere, because the principle of press freedom is being hollowed out by its loudest proponents. For human rights abusers who are criticized by the West for incarcerating journalists, political dissidents and human rights defenders, their answer is simple, immediate and devastating. What about Assange? 
From Amnesty to the OSCE to the Council of Europe and the UN, the voices clamoring for Julian's release are strong and mutually reinforcing. They must grow louder and louder until there is nowhere for the UK, US and Australian governments to turn. Those governments must constantly crash into this case, just like Saudi Arabia does with the Khashoggi assassination. It is too late for Khashoggi, but it is not too late for Julian. As lawmakers, you have unique avenues and powers at your disposal to press for Julian's release and call for an end to his persecution. I'd like to thank Richard Bergen for organizing the symposium, the cross parliamentary groups in Australia, Germany, and the UK for the work they have already done to put an end to this, and to each of you individually and collectively for stepping up to save Julian's life and our collective freedoms.
Defendants in WEDTAC were involved with IFC and Chemcom. IFCs that traded over the counter? IFC, London Exchange. London Exchange. Mm -hmm. International Signal Control. I owned a thousand shares. I sold it when, I, when things started hitting the puff. International Signal? Signal with yeah. Them? Now they just did a multi billion dollar merger with this company in London. They're probably thinking it's no, going to cover the tracks. United Kencon is a local corporation. Yeah. Yep. Uh, like, but it's in bankruptcy right now. Yeah. As of this, this last three months. But with eighteen billion dollars in liabilities. Okay. What they did was they got fronted all that money, started the contracts, went bankrupt. Now the government stuck for eighteen million dollars. Yeah, they weren't paying employees. They weren't. They weren't producing the product. They weren't paying their unemployment. They were else. Uh, no. And it turns out that Christian, who, who I've had a few dealings with, uh, had an office that would be suiting of any, I mean, AT&T executive would have this on security. Amazing. It was these racquetball things in his office. Uh, four or five cars, houses. Let me tell you about you, something about Jim Christian now. I know right now, in this town viewpoint, I stole money, I'm insane, and I'm willing to take. I'll tell you, I will not condemn Jim Christian until he tells me to my face what happened. Go ahead. I was framed and set up, and people, and I know oh, I see what you're your experience. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if, maybe Jim Christian doesn't have the money. Maybe Garen has it or somebody else. $18 million is a lot of money. Yeah, you can't even flounder that. And he is broke yeah. because he lives with one of my best friends, Mr. I mean, they don't have money. And I would think that if he took it, he'd have something. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty nice to say, Stan, about somebody that's in your guts for five years. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know what the guy's going I know what I'm going through. And who knows, maybe he was, maybe he was innocent, too. Yeah. This is Christian you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Is your forgiving nature coming out again? <laughs> Iraqi Scud missiles, crude, inaccurate, and for the most part, ineffective. But the Iraqi military was well on its way to developing a far more powerful and accurate ballistic missile, one that was intended to carry nuclear warheads. And federal investigators tell us that some of the necessary equipment being used in that program came from the United States. If there were no license with these shipments, I am absolutely shocked to learn that that sort of activity was taking place. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Television and investigative journalism is something of an uneasy match. Television news thrives on immediacy. Thorough investigations take time. Television stories need pictures, video. Investigations attempt to uncover events which someone has tried to conceal. It's difficult to illustrate a cover-up, but try to be patient with us. What we're going to report tonight is part of an ongoing investigative effort by ABC News Nightline and the Financial Times of London. It is only one piece of what we believe to be a much larger fabric. But let's focus on what a number of sources, both inside and outside the U.S. government, have already confirmed for us. Remember these scenes? They were shot by an ABC News camera team in Baghdad on the night of January 16th, when U.S. aircraft began their bombing campaign against the Iraqi capital. That blizzard of anti-aircraft fire was directed, in part, by a radar tracking system sold to the Iraqi government by a company in South Africa. 
The South Africans sold quite a number of militarily useful items to Iraq, including cluster bombs and fuses. Those sales were handled by a Chilean middleman. But South Africa also conveyed to Baghdad some key technology that Iraq was using in the development of its ballistic missile system. All of this, the radar tracking system, the cluster bomb technology, the ballistic missile components, were sold by South Africa to Iraq. But most of what they sold, the South Africans had purchased from a company here in the United States. Officers of the CIA knew about those sales from the United States to South Africa, knew what was going, knew how it was getting there. Even though such sales were and are against the law, the CIA did nothing to stop them. Nightline correspondent Jeff Greenfield has details of the story that was compiled by reporters from ABC News Nightline and the Financial Times. When you talk about the American heartland, you're talking about a place like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's Amish country. It's small town Main Street. It's Norman Rockwell covers of the Saturday Evening Post. Lancaster, Pennsylvania was also the home of International Signal and Control, a homegrown business that was a major regional employer and whose founder and chairman, James Guerin, was a generous regional benefactor. Guerin was probably the greatest philanthropist in the decade of the 80s that Lancaster has ever known. There was something unknowable about the nature of the business, but it was sort of thought to be, okay, that's government stuff, it's, somehow it's okay. What ISC did was to make or supply military hardware and components, everything from cluster bombs to state-of-the-art electronic gear to blueprints, so their customers could build bomb factories of their own. But it's not what ISC made or supplied that has made it the target of federal prosecutors for the last two years. It's where ISC's equipment and technology and know-how wound up, and how it got there. An ABC Nightline Financial Times investigation has unraveled a startling story with three key elements. First, that highly sophisticated technology flowed from ISC to South Africa, including technology critical to long-range missile development, missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Second, this technology went from the United States to South Africa in clear violation of the law. Third, these shipments went on for years with the full knowledge of Central Intelligence Agency officials. What's more, federal investigators say they have good reason to believe that some of this technology, including ballistic missile technology, shipped illegally from ISC to South Africa, was in turn sold to Iraq, where it wound up as part of Saddam Hussein's military machine that the U.S. fought against in the Gulf War. If these reports are true, and uh, I take it there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that they are, uh, then we have a renegade operation on our hands uh, for whom the rule of law means nothing, uh, for which the elected representatives apparently have no control, have no ability to direct policy, have no ability to say what they can and cannot do. It all started legally, if covertly, back in 1974. That's when the National Security Agency, a super-secret U.S. intelligence unit, asked ISC to help it complete Project X, a chain of electronic listening posts based at South Africa's Simonstown Naval Station. South Africa was using these posts to follow Soviet submarine traffic off the Cape of Good Hope. To ensure secrecy, ISC and the NSA made sure the shipments could not be traced back to them. They created a company called Gamma Systems Associates. In fact, this company was nothing more than a post office box at John F. Kennedy Airport. Gamma was a cutout. In other words, it's a straw man company, which uh, is technically not part of the government, but it's uh, agreeable to the wishes of the government. But this sanctioned covert operation stopped in 1977, when President Carter, a strong opponent of South Africa's apartheid regime, told U.S. firms to stop any military-related business with Pretoria. But ISC continued shipping electronics, some civilians, some military, to South Africa. Then, in the early 1980s, South Africa began to intensify its efforts at ballistic missile development. For ISC, that was a golden opportunity because one of its top executives was a man named Clyde Ivey, an American electronics expert who has been called the father of South Africa's missile program. Ivey had extraordinary contacts in that nation's defense structure. 
Beginning in 1984, federal investigators say, senior ISC executives, including Clyde Ivey, began regular contacts with CIA officials. And, these investigators add, the CIA officials had already been following what ISC was sending to South Africa. Over the next four years, the agency learned the whole picture. Reporter Tom Flannery is part of the ABC Financial Times investigation. Well, they knew that ISC was uh, utilizing a former national security agency cutout company, Gamma Systems Associates, to ship large volumes of very expensive, highly sophisticated military equipment illegally to South Africa from 1984 through 1989. And did the CIA tell anybody at all about it? They told not a soul, neither law enforcement nor legislative. And what specifically did the CIA know that ISC was sending to South Africa? Some of the most sophisticated electronic gear imaginable. Telemetry tracking equipment used to receive signals from missiles. Gyroscopes used to guide the missiles. And photo imaging equipment called film readers used to monitor a missile's performance. This equipment is exactly what a country would need to develop, test, and perfect long-range nuclear-capable ballistic missiles, which is what South Africa was doing in the mid-1980s. I think it's inconceivable that the equipment would be used for any other purpose. This was not small-scale business. The telemetry tracking equipment alone added up to nearly 20 tons, enough to fill a healthy chunk of a 747 cargo plane. Not everything ISC shipped was so enormous, but ISC was shipping equipment to South Africa almost every week for four years, much of it through the Gamma Systems Associate cutout. Moreover, this flatly illegal business went on, leaving an elaborate paper trail, utterly unimpeded by U.S. law enforcement, right up until the end of 1988. I would be shocked, and I would feel that I had been lied to if any sort of operation were going in which the agency or any other intelligence organization was trying to abuse customs by going around it or going through it. Indeed, the laws on the books passed by the Congress couldn't have been clearer in banning the sale of American military technology to South Africa. But there's another more disturbing twist to this tale of illegal arms shipments. Once the American-made hardware went to South Africa, it didn't stop there. South Africa, after all, has a major arms industry. And, as former Ambassador Herman Nichols says, it was an industry in the mid-1980s very hungry for customers. I think the, the South Africans at that stage you know, were quite keen to, to sell almost anywhere. Including Iraq. For instance, ISC sold South Africa fuses for cluster bombs, one of the most effective killing machines around. South Africa took that technology and in turn sold hundreds of thousands of bomb fuses to Iraq, a deal brokered by Chilean arms merchant Carlos Cardoon, one of the biggest suppliers of weapons to a grateful Saddam Hussein. In other instances, American technology went directly from South Africa to Iraq. What kind of technology? Well, look again at this incredible footage from the bombing of Baghdad on January 16th. That, says one American law enforcement official, that was some of the stuff that got through to Iraq through the ISC shipments to South Africa. In this case, electronic components of a South African radar system guiding Iraq's anti-aircraft guns. Finally, federal investigators say even American missile technology made its way from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to South Africa to Iraq. Had the Gulf War not intervened, Saddam Hussein would have been well on the way to developing an operational Condor II missile, giving him, with the critical help of American-born technology, the power to deliver chemical or even nuclear weapons anywhere in the Middle East. I'm Jeff Greenfield for Nightline. We contacted the CIA this morning, gave them the broad outlines of the story you've just heard and seen, and requested a reaction. At 7.15 this evening, the agency faxed to us the following statement. The Central Intelligence Agency declines to comment on these allegations concerning the activities of the International Signal and Control Corporation. However, it is the CIA's policy to cooperate fully with the Department of Justice on matters relating to possible violations of U.S. laws. We suggest that Nightline contact the Department of Justice regarding these allegations. That statement, as you may have noticed, is silent on the allegations of CIA misconduct. But, as suggested, we contacted Justice. It was by then, of course, after business hours, but a Justice Department spokesman returned our call. His statement was even simpler than the CIA's. 
it is not something we would comment on one way or the other. When we come back, we'll discuss the implications of this story. Joining us now here in our Washington bureau are Senator Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania, who served on the Senate Intelligence Committee during the years when the weapons transfer took place. Jeffrey Kemp, a member of the Reagan administration's National Security Council and author of a forthcoming book on the global arms race. Stephen Bryan, former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, whose job was to stop the transfer of weapons technology. And one of the principal reporters in this investigation, Lionel Barber of the Financial Times of London. Senator Specter, as I just noted, you were a member of the Intelligence Committee during this period. Uh, should such an operation, had it been sanctioned, have come to the attention of your committee or some other congressional committee? Uh, if, in fact, there was such an operation, and I'm answering a hypothetical question because we only have the allegation, it would be the responsibility of the CIA to tell the Intelligence Committee under applicable law. They'd have to give a timely notification. Would you be free to tell us if indeed such notification was made? No, I would not be free to tell you one way or the other because all of that would be secret. But I can give you this generalization uh, that in the period from December of 1986 after Iran-Contra broke, uh, there was a very intense effort made by CIA uh, to be extremely careful on notification of covert activities. You and I spoke the other day, uh, and we were discussing in general terms the inclination of the Bush administration now to be responsive to this kind of thing. In other words, to make sure that, that Congress is known. Uh, and, and if memory serves me correctly, you were suggesting that the, the administration really is disinclined to do that. Well, I believe that the president uh, is inclined to make known covert operations. Uh, there has been a refusal on the part of counsel to the president, and I'll be specific, uh, Boyden Gray, the uh, lawyer who's counsel to the president, who very strenuously resisted an effort to have a statutory notification put into law. Uh, uh, the uh, officials around the president and the National Security Council, according to my understanding, and I've had it from very authoritative sources, were willing to have a statutory 48-hour notice, but Mr. Gray, Borden Gray, the counsel to the president, was adamant in refusal on the ground that it would impinge on the president's constitutional authority. Mr. Bryan, I, I know you're somewhat skeptical just of the general notion that this kind of weapons technology would flow from the United States to South Africa. Is that correct? Well, I'm, I'm more uh, skeptical about it flowing to Iraq. Uh, I worked on the Condor case. In fact, I uh, tried to block it, and I think we mortally wounded that project, and I never heard of any technology coming out of uh, South Africa. Primary source was West Germany uh, and Italy, and to a lesser extent, Argentina. But what about the notion of this kind of technology flowing from the United States to South Africa? Well, we, we tried very hard during this uh, period to interdict any technology that we knew of going to South Africa or to any other country that was blocked from receiving military technology from the United States. And uh, this is a, a story that I never have heard before. It, does, it, does it surprise you that weapons technology would flow, perhaps even without the knowledge of senior officials at the Defense Department? Uh, nothing ever surprises me nowadays, but uh, it's certainly not a story that we knew of uh, at the time that I served in the uh, Reagan administration. Dr. Kemp, uh, give us your sense of what justification, because indeed the whole notion, A, of weapons technology flowing from the United States to South Africa, and then B, as Mr. Bryan suggests, uh, that technology flowing from South Africa to Iraq, on the face of it, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the South Africans and the Israelis, for example, are very close. The Israelis and the Iraqis are and have been for a long time bitter enemies. How, how could one justify something like that, even from a purely logical point of view? Well, I have no idea what the real story is, but in the, certainly in the 70s, remember, we were concerned about the Cape Route, the flow of oil around the Cape Route, and Soviet uh, warships. So that could be a reason for having 
some understanding with the South Africans, I think that was the reason. In the 1980s, it, could, it might have had something to do with us wanting to know what the South Africans knew about Israeli nuclear weapons and what the cooperation was, if any, between South Africa and Israel. That's purely hypothetical on my case, but you know, in the past, technology has been used as a hard currency to get things or to persuade governments to do things that they might not otherwise want to do. This may be a case where that was going on. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'd like to go to my colleague Lionel Barber and, and nail down a few loose ends here. We'll continue our conversation in a moment. Continuing now with Lionel Barber of the Financial Times. Lionel, uh, some of our guests here are skeptical, which is understandable, because so were you and I when we first began getting wind of this story. Uh, speak for a moment, if you would, about the, uh, about the documentary evidence that relates specifically to the transfer of the technology from the United States to South Africa. Well, we have got uh, bills of lading um, uh, referring to the technology which left JFK Airport, and it specifically notes that the items concerned, missile technology and other advanced weapons, required export licenses. Uh, we know that they did not have export licenses and therefore were in violation of U.S. law. Is there any reason to believe that there could have been, and I'd like you to explain, if you would, for, uh, what a presidential finding is, that there might have been a presidential finding which, which, which could have perhaps set aside even U.S. law uh, and, and permitted this kind of an operation to go forward? Well, a presidential finding, uh, which is, uh, sees uh, a... Uh, covert operation is in the national interest uh, of the United States would have to be uh, passed on or the information would have to go to relevant congressional uh, senior congressional members and we have contacted several of those who would have been in a position to know who ought to have been told and they say they know nothing about this at all but I think there's a very important point here Ted the fact is that uh, informed officials in and outside the government have told us that actually the CIA knew about these shipments, but it was not a sanctioned covert operation. And in that respect, they wouldn't have had to inform Congress. But there's only one problem here, and that is that if CIA officials were aware of legal, of, of violations of the law, they needed to pass on the information to the Justice Department, and they did not. Mr. Bryan, uh, you were shaking your head a moment ago. Why? Well, because it's not the CIA's job to enforce the law. Their job is to provide the information to the government officials who, who have that responsibility. And, and uh, typically, uh, uh, they know about thousands and thousands of, of these kinds of things that go on, and they, they report them diligently. And uh, government officials try to sort through them, try to pick out the ones they think are the most uh, serious uh, to go after them and, and to deal with them. Well, well Ted, if I could just come back here, I think... Uh, the fact is that we know that there were breaches of the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act in 1986, Export Administration Act, uh, the U.S. arms embargo. I mean, there was plenty of evidence to suggest uh, that, that there were violations of the law and that the CIA had a responsibility to pass on that information to the Department of Justice. Ted, may I raise a question? Please. Uh, a key point which has been made here is whether the matter was sanctioned by the CIA. Now, that's really the critical factor. The obligation of the CIA to report to the Intelligence Committee and the obligation of the CIA to report violations of law arises when the officials, responsible officials of the CIA, know about it. When Lionel uses the word sanctioned, the question arises in my mind as to whether it was a rogue operation and not known to the top officials of the CIA. Uh, when Lionel has documented uh, certain bills of ladings as to the transaction to South Africa, I would be interested, if he cares to, to document the uh, evidence that shows knowledge on the part of uh, CIA top officials uh, to show that it was, in fact, sanctioned. Right. Lionel? Well, we have uh, been working on this story for a number of weeks. We have contacted dozens of people. We have interviewed people over and over again. and. We have uh, several sources who say that there were regular briefings between ISC uh, executives and CI officers on what was going out from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to South Africa. 
Whether that information was passed up the ladder, higher up to uh, senior CIA uh, officials, uh, I do not know. Let me raise a somewhat broader question and, and pose it again to Senator Specter. I thought, uh, and you use a term which had a great resonance in the mid-70s, a rogue operation. I thought that kind of thing was supposed to have been brought under control. Well, uh, it is supposed to have been brought under control, uh, but I picked up Lionel's term on sanction, and he injected the concept that uh, the operation may not have, uh, have been sanctioned. If there's any evidence that anybody from the CIA was involved, I can tell you flatly uh, that the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, which I had served on, and the House Intelligence Committee for that matter, would be very interested to pursue the matter. And it may well be, and I would expect that uh, the top CIA officials would be too. If there is evidence, uh, it ought to be pursued in official channels as well as the investigation, which of course uh, uh, the Financial Times has every right, and as does Nightline, to pursue. Let me just warn our affiliates that we're going to be going a, a few minutes over our allotted time tonight so that we can complete uh, at least this phase of the story. Uh, and let me just put to uh, Dr. Kemp for a moment. What we are discussing here, Dr. Kemp, is, after all, uh, not just an occasional shipment, but almost weekly shipments that went on for four years, including some very sophisticated, militarily important equipment that went aboard South African Airways from JFK to Pretoria, as I say, week after week after week, over a period of four to five years. Yes, extraordinary, and uh, I think the story should come out. But I would just say in the historical context, the period we're talking about, uh, say 84 to 88, don't forget the focus of all our operations, CIA, the Justice Department, everybody, was Operation Stealth, uh, uh, to staunch, sorry, to stop the flow of arms to Iran. And it could well be that people knew this was going on and really didn't follow up on it, that some people in the CIA had an idea something was up, but there were other priorities because, you know, there is uh, so many of these activities uh, being tracked down all the time that to follow everyone diligently the way we look as though we should have done now is perhaps to hope for too much. Too. Well, we are talking about more than just uh, an occasional word getting to the CIA. We are talking about regular quarterly briefings, again, that took place over a period of four to five years. But we're going to have to take a break, and we'll continue in a moment. Stephen Bryan, let's bring our discussion around to today's events and the general spread of weapons technology. There is, there is a move afoot now to lower some of the barriers in trading with communist countries. Uh, so if you would, perhaps you could bring us uh, around to a concluding point having to do just with the general spread of technology and how when we transfer weapons to one country, we have very little control over what happens to those weapons then. Well, right at the moment, uh, in fact, tomorrow, uh, we will be releasing with our allies uh, uh, an incredible array of uh, technology that can be used to make uh, weapons. Uh, it will be released to the communist countries like the Soviet Union and China. And as you uh, are well aware, the Soviets uh, supplied Iraq with the bulk of their weapons, and the, the Chinese have been selling missiles and, and other uh, sensitive uh, equipment uh, in the Middle East. Uh, so where we're going is utterly in the wrong direction, it seems to me, in terms of uh, developing a coherent control regime over weapons, and particularly over weapons technology that threatens, I think, uh, world peace. And Dr. Kemp, a closing comment from you on the same subject, if you would. We can't control everything. We've got to decide what are the most dangerous and most important items. Nuclear weapons, surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Let's focus our efforts on those. I think we can get cooperation with the Russians and possibly the Chinese and certainly the Europeans. If we try to cover everything, we're not going to get anywhere. We're going to antagonize a lot of people and we'll end up much worse than we are today. Senator Spector, 30 seconds. I think we ought to do our best to cover everything. I wouldn't accept that assertion at all, that we can't cover everything. If it can be used for weapon uh, proliferation, it ought to be stopped. And it's an absolute outrage what has happened in the past and what continues to happen. And we ought to try to stop everything related to uh, the proliferation of weapons. Gentlemen, I thank you all very much. Dr. Kemp, Mr. Bryan, Mr. Spector, Lionel Barber. Uh, as I indicated at the top of this broadcast, this is part of a continuing puzzle that we are trying to piece together. We'll have further reports in the future. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News.